Greetings, greetings, one and all, and welcome to Skep Talk. Today is uh, the 20th of November in the year of our Lord, 2023, uh, and we're here to take your calls, as usual. Uh, Skep Talk is a hell of a show. We get people with, with specific expertise in specific areas, uh, and today I'm so happy to be joined by my friend Gordon Walker, uh, the, the, the greatest mycologist in the whole damn world. Gordon, how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm doing well. I, I don't even consider myself a mycologist. I'm technically a biochemist, but we're here to talk about right. mushrooms and fungi. So let's do it. <laughs> it's just, it's the thing that I associate you with because it's just something that brings so like, much joy to you and to all your followers. It's 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 just something that's so cool. Um, as usual, we're always going to prioritize calls about theism or about uh, 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 supernatural claims or anything like that. But if you're particularly interested in fungi or about evolution or about biology in general, this is the show for you to call in and ask your questions. That's what we're here for. Um, I, I really will quickly, say that pretty much yeah. every aspect of life is touched by fungi. So everything we discuss, I can probably find a fungal element to it. I, I, I was I saw this picture and it was like, you know, coddling this one dog while the other dog just kind of sat sad in the corner. And it's like people loving zoology and talking about animals and flowers, and then fungi being literally fungi. the basis of all life on land. <laughs> it's great. Yes. Um, but uh, hey, you can call in. Uh, you can either use the link down below. We should have a, a thing popping up there. Uh, or you can call us at 720-619-2288 uh, to jump in the call queue. We still have a few lines open right now, although they are already filling up. So especially if you are a theist or a creationist or someone who has questions about mushrooms, give us a holler. We'd love to be talking to you. Um, also, I uh, want to remind everybody that Super Chats of $5 or more will be read after the uh, towards the end of the show. Uh, so if you have something specific that you want to say to Gordon or I, or something that you want to talk about or you want to ask questions about, but you don't want to call in, you can also do that as well. Super Chat over $5 shows your appreciation, supports the channel, and also it'll get us to, to talk directly about it. Um, with that, uh, Gordon, do you want to take a second to like just kind of introduce yourself and your channel and, and all the things that people know what's going on with you? Sure. Uh, my name is Gordon Walker. I'm a PhD biochemist. I got trained in the biochemistry of wine and beer fermentation, specifically looking at yeast, a single-celled fungus that converts sugar into ethanol. Uh, and I come from a background of having, you know, knowing stuff about food science, aroma, uh, bioengineering, and processing. I was did technical sales for a little while and went around to a lot of places like Impossible Foods and was actually looking at like the yeast that they use to make the uh, red protein that gives Impossible Burger its sort of meatiness. Uh, and I've had a lot of experience now teaching people about mushrooms online, because when I finished my PhD, I decided to just go headlong into mushrooms and fungi as a, as a kingdom and really expand kind of what was a childhood interest and has just become an obsession for me as an adult. And over the years, I've built up uh, something like 2.7 million followers across platforms because people seem to really like mushrooms. and uh, I and sort of a conduit to helping people learn about mushrooms and fungi. And there's a lot of mycophobia and misconceptions and weird things out there. So I'm in this constant sort of struggle to help educate people um, and expose people to mushrooms and fungi in the hopes that they will become fascinated themselves and hopefully care a little bit more about our planet and, and nature. So cool. So cool. Love it. I love every bit of it. I'm so happy that you're here, dude. Uh, with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and jump straight into calls so that we can uh, hurry along with the inevitable 10 billion fungi jokes that we're going to deal with for the rest of this the show. Um, I'm sure those are just as fun for you as run for us run jokes are for me. Um, we've got a couple of calls already lining up. So I'm going to start with Megan, pronoun she, her, uh, calling in from MD, which I think is Maryland, or maybe she's just a doctor. I don't know. Uh, wants to talk about Einstein's conservation of energy and how she thinks it could be related to ghosts. Megan, you're on Skep Talk. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm really good. So lay your premise on us. What what are you talking about here with, with, with ghosts and energy and things? Okay. Um, is it okay if I give a little bit of a brief background to kind of uh, give you an idea where I'm coming from? Totally, yeah. As long as you're not going to give us a 30-minute thesis statement. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it'll be quick, I promise. <laughs> um, so I was Christian, and... Basically, as a Christian, one of the things I believed in is souls. And um, I also believed in ghosts. And so I thought 
ghosts were souls because it made sense to my worldview. Um, so fast forward forward to like this year, I became an atheist, and so I kind of took an inventory. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you were actually one of the um, atheists that kind of helped me uh, become an atheist. <laughs> awesome! Thank you so much. That means a lot to me. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go on. <laughs> no problem. Um, so basically, I took an inventory of what I believed as a Christian, and I wanted to see, like, if there was anything from Christianity that kind of still fit my new worldview. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things that I start to no longer believe in was, were souls. It, it didn't quite make sense to me anymore. Um, so previously, I believed ghosts were souls. Now, I don't believe in, ghosts, uh, in souls, but I still believe in ghosts. But if ghosts aren't souls, then what are they? So um, yesterday, um, yeah, yesterday you were on another show with um, Jamie, and mm -hmm. I was actually listening it to it um, today while I was working. And I believe you guys were reading super chats, and one of those super chats was talking about, uh, I, I think reincarnation. I think they talked about how um, something about like when you die, the energy goes out and like goes into another body or something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. That sounds and then you commented. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, you commented, um, about like energy can't be created nor destroyed, which that was familiar to me. I've heard that, but you also said, um, but it can be changed. So that got me thinking. Um, so I looked up, Einstein's conservation of energy because I, I kind of had like a basic high school understanding of it. Like I'm a very much a lay person, um, so I kind of looked it up and um, it it talked about how all energy remains constant and it cannot be created nor destroyed, but it like changes into another form of energy and that energy like goes out into the environment. So that got me yeah. thinking maybe ghosts are like energy that go so, out into the environment after we die. Yeah. So do you, do you want the, the, uh, I'll give you both. I, I'll give you a, a brief answer and then a more complex detailed answer that I'm sure Gordon would love to talk about as well, especially with fungi. guys, but uh, not trying to hold you down to fungi, but especially with that, we're talking about energy mm -hmm. and, and, and recycle. I was going to talk about biogeochemical cycles, but um, the, uh, so the first thing that I would say is that I understand exactly where you're coming from because I used to think the same things. Um, I was raised all sorts of pagan and, and, and believe in all sorts of magic and spirits and ghosts and all these things. I never believed in souls, but like ghosts is like this ethereal echo of a person's existence that carries on and watches over their uh, the descendants for generations and all these things. Like I, oh, I made all sorts of excuses for that. The, the first thing mm -hmm. that I would say, and I think we'll come back to this later, is why would you believe such a thing exists in the first place? Before you try to justify why or what it is and try to quantify it and say, oh, well, it might be this, the first question that I would have is why do you think it's real first? Like, I'm not going to try to explain to you, you know, the the the, the physical you know, uh, properties of the, the, you know, dreams of Jupiter until I can tell you that that's a real thing that matters <laughs> in our world. Um, but that's, that's, you know, a separate issue for now. Uh, you asked specifically about this. Um, as far as conservation of energy is concerned, the example that I gave yesterday, if I remember correctly, was breaking a car. And so you have a rotor turning, mm -hmm. that's mechanical energy, and then the brake pads apply to it, compress it, the mechanical energy changes into thermal energy. So the energy didn't go anywhere. It just went mm -hmm. from moving the tire to heat that radiates out in all directions randomly. So it becomes a stochastic thing as opposed to this productive thing. Um, that doesn't mean that there's any remnant of the car moving that's left over in that okay. heat signature. You know what I mean? And so what you're talking about there when we talk about energy and with, with us, there's all sorts of energy in us. There's thermal energy, there's mechanical energy, mainly there's chemical energy, energy stored within the chemical bonds of our, of our tissues. Um, 
And that's what you mm-hmm. get whenever you eat something, whenever you eat plants, animals, fungi, whatever, you are breaking down the chemical bonds in their tissues and using that chemical energy to fuel your body and make tissues of your own. Um, and so that's what we're talking about with conversion of energy in terms of life and death. No part of that has any display or evidence of any supernatural remnant of the thing. And the final challenge I would give you, and then I'll move over to to Gordon because this will be my third thing. The first thing is, does it exist at all? The second thing is, that's not what energy means. And the third thing is, if you don't accept souls, then why aren't there ghosts of every tree, of every mushroom, of every bacteria, (laughs) of every dog, of everything? Does every other living thing have a ghost? And if it's only humans, what makes us so special about it? Um, Those are my three things. Gordon, do you have anything else you want to add before we go forward with it? Because I was going to dig into a whole thing but i don't think it's necessary well i mean first of all you know the the first law of thermodynamics is is basically what you said um and like you said you can go from like kinetic to stored energy kind of thing uh if we do think you know and drawing on the metaphor there of of fungi uh if a tree dies tree doesn't have a ghost and i don't i don't think we went around and talked about the souls Mm -hmm. of trees or the ghosts of trees anyone would take you seriously um, but people still talk about that <laughs> with regards to humans and even sometimes animals. You know, there's idea that like, oh, maybe your life didn't end well. And now you're stuck in this realm. Great idea. There's no evidence for it. And we've measured every single kind of possible chemical energetic signature and have never once ever found any sign of anything relating to, you know, a ghostly like apparition figure. And like that it makes for uh, horrible TV. Actually, those ghost hunter shows are terrible. Um, <laughs> so old South Park episode making fun of him the other day, and it, it was just guys like peeing themselves. And I was like, "Yeah, that sounds about right." Um, but but think about this: so we have a tree that dies, and it's going to get decomposed usually by several waves of fungi. So there's a what's called a succession, ecological succession of organisms. As one thing eats the tree, another thing eats the tree, another thing eats that, another thing eats that. So like things are constantly kind of like breaking and riffing off of each other by cycling those nutrients. And to fully take a tree and go back to soil, there's a long succession of not just fungi, but bacteria and small sweet protist things and small nematodes and tardigrades, and then larger things. And that builds up what's called a food web. So there's this kind of energetic flow of stuff through nature, starting out with your primary producers, which are things that are fixing the energy of the sun through photosynthesis to make carbon. Um, and then it's fungi and bacteria, particularly at the basis of that food web, that do a lot of the cycling of the carbon and uh, nitrogen, the organic molecules that make up life. So within nature is contained this cyclical thing. And to that end, I don't believe really in souls or ghosts, but there's this idea in um, Hinduism called Brahman, which is sort of the idea of like the universal energy of everything. Um, and Isaac Asimov has a great thing called, called Gaia. And, many, many different versions of this repeated in sci-fi and other things, but the idea that everything is part of a whole, and to some degree, all matter in this universe must be something, right? Because it's not antimatter, so it's matter, Mm -hmm. and thus it has something in common, and all of that matter has to, it can't be created, it can't be destroyed, it's just simply shifting form, and guess what? Fungi are really, really good at changing the form of things. So including ourselves as we get decomposed, fungi, bacteria, all of these things are playing a role in that. And so I'd say that our energy, our souls may not be a tangible thing, but everything about us that is tangible is then getting biotransformed and broken down in that ecological secession. So we do go back to the earth and become part of a whole, even if it's in a very kind of sciencey way. Yeah. Does that make sense to you, Megan? Are are we, are we missing the point of what you're saying or do you kind of, are you smelling what we're stepping in here? (laughs) I I think that makes sense. I think definitely later I'll have to go back and listen again and and uh, try to do a little bit more research on it. Um, I, I I think the the main reason why I believe in ghosts is because I have had some experiences. Um, if, if I could give you maybe one experience that I've had. Sure. Um, okay, so this was um, when I was in high school. Um, my cousin and her family had moved into this uh, new house, and they had renovated it before they um, moved in. And uh, a little while after they moved in, my cousin wanted to get her friends together, and I was also invited. And there was, like, you know, sleepover. 
And uh, we had put on the movie The Craft. So after we watched that movie, um, we were just kind of like talking about it. Like, oh my God, that movie was so cool. Um, And then suddenly we hear cabinet doors like opening and like slamming shut in the kitchen. And this was like late at night. Her parents were asleep. It was just like us downstairs. And so me and my cousin kind of like uh, sneakily, like slowly went around the corner to the kitchen to see what was going on. And then right before we like turned the corner, suddenly everything stopped. And then we just hear like what, what I remember thinking was like the basement door just suddenly slamming shut. And then also the kitchen light was, kind of on when it's been off like that whole night I when I think back to that moment I'm just like I don't know how I can explain that in a like I don't know skeptical mindset so I think the what you just said at the end there is really critical I don't know how I can explain that that's a fine thing to say I don't know what happened But what you're doing is you're saying, I don't know what happened. Therefore, I know what happened. It was a ghost. And like, that's Mm -hmm. a really, really common trap that people fall into where, you know, you, that that sounds freaky as shit. I've had similar deals with that all my life. Uh, uh, um, A common example that I give on shows like this is that directly behind these bookshelves here, directly behind this wall is a hallway that leads to my bedroom. And every single morning when I walk down this hallway, the air pressure, it's kind of a narrow hallway and the air pressure that I'm carrying with me and I move and the air shifts around, the door slams behind me. I don't touch it. Every single day when I walk down the hallway, the door closes. And it's just because me moving through it changes the air pressure so here you are in this house and some cabinet door slam and uh, a, a, a basement door slams could it be warping of the wood could it be a cat that got in there and started messing? could some random dude maybe somebody was burglarizing the house and, and escaped at that moment and you didn't <laughs> it, it close me maybe, like, maybe you prevented they, a robbery may exactly your, your, your fear actually <laughs> saved it. and so and then you add on top of that However many years, maybe even decades since that event with a lot of there's this really crazy thing that our memories do or we will invent new details and believe them and like it gets crazier and crazier and the fish gets bigger and bigger every mm-hmm. time you tell the story and it's real in your brain. Um, so you have the fear. You're not thinking clearly. You have the fact that you were young and you don't know what's going on. You have years of to ruminate on it all of an event that you already admitted you don't know what the hell happened and all of that makes for a really really good ghost story but at the end of the day it's just a story and as gordon pointed out we've actually done real laboratory tests where we've looked for ghosts in all sorts of different ways and we haven't found anything yet so it's it's kind of like bigfoot he's always there until somebody pulls out a camera and then he vanishes and it's it's the same thing with ghosts it's until we are mm-hmm. measuring everybody has a reason to believe in them and then the second we start measuring all those reasons go out the window and, and as scientists if there was a new metric for measuring a kind of energy that led to ghosts i would then admit be like wow look at this kind of energy signature and look we keep finding these creepy old houses you know zooming between walls and stuff like that yeah. like wow maybe that's evidence for ghosts up until that point happens until we you know invent some new kind of thermal camera or something that catches that kind of activity and trust me they have tried all of those ghost shows are have done every Mm -hmm. conceivable version of looking for stuff and i don't think they've ever found a single thing that's part of why i think most of those shows went off the air because ultimately like you can only fake it for so long before people are like all right i'm done watching this um just the same with the bigfoot stuff bigfoot was you know gonna exist (laughs) There's there's po- plausible pseudo scientific explanations for a lot of things, but until you have an actual concrete piece of proof, I'm not going to take it legitimately. Mm-hmm. And I think that's any scientist worth their salt is going to say, "Cool, just show me the data. If you have data, I'll look at it. If you have fabricated yeah. data that has bad methods behind it, I will also look at that and debunk it. But until the fact that I can actually see something um, observationally true, we have to say it's not you know not happening." Right. That, that, that's the major, okay. major issue with it is that it's, it is, it, there's a reason why it's such an old belief and there's a reason why it's such a persistent belief, but there's also a big reason why we've never been able to prove it. 
it, it, it you you have nothing to be ashamed of for being convinced of this for for a long time because like I said there's a reason why lots of people do it's a fear response and it's something that's that's persistent but you know there's that old David Hume quote either the laws of nature have been suspended or I made a mistake which one's more likely you know does that answer your question Megan right. yeah I think so I think you've given me a lot to think about too. Most definitely. If you want to get real geeked up about everything that Jordan was, uh, uh, Gordon was talking about earlier, I called you Jordan. Everything that Gordon was talking about a minute ago. Also, uh, if you head over to my channel, Light of Evolution, episode four, I talk about what are called biogeochemical cycles, which talk about the carbon cycle, the water cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the way that all of these things make our bodies cycle through the, the, the atmosphere, cycle through the soil, cycle through the whole world, the whole biosphere around us. Um, and so you, when you die, your body becomes part of the air, part of the water, part of the plants, part of just as they have become part of you and built your body, your body becomes part of them and builds somebody else. And that is a more beautiful and more fascinating and much, much, much more real explanation for for you know the continuation of these things that still doesn't say shit about the persistent consciousness but it's still pretty freaking cool and it might be fun for you to learn about if you're into it i'll say one good? more really quick okay, yeah. quick thing is that people have a tendency to always try to make meaning out of life i think it's a very human tendency it's, it's why we have religion it's why we have creation myths it's why we have ghosts mm -hmm. right we are constantly trying to explain the things that we can't quite explain or understand so like for a said, no reason to be ashamed of this. This is a completely normal human uh, feeling to have that. And it's okay for you as you reconstruct what your meaning in the world is going to be to take in that new info, that new data, and construct a new version of how you understand things in the world. Um, and like I said, if you yeah. want to get into sort of some sort of spiritual thing, you could look up and read about uh, Brahman in Hinduism and try to understand philosophically what some of those other things are. And maybe there's different versions of spirituality out there that might jive a little bit better with your newer understanding of the world that's hopefully based in science. Yeah, man. Okay. Well, I hope this you. helps. I, I know, Seriously. Um, it, oh. No, go ahead. Uh, I, I was just going to say, I know um, either it's either Aaron Ra or Matt Dillahunty, they say, um, you know, I want to believe in as many true things as possible, and you know, I I definitely want to do that as well. So if if <laughs> ghost is something that's not true, then you know I want to be able to I guess deconstruct from that belief as well. Most definitely, and I that is an admirable trait, dude. Seriously, well, thank you so much for calling us today. Seriously, I really do appreciate it. you've been an amazing first call to the for the show. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye bye, Megan. Great. <laughs> we even managed Super to bring Columbia nice. into that <laughs> right i was hoping that we would like i said i don't want to pin you down with that being the only trick that you're allowed to perform but I like i love getting to link it back a little bit you know what i mean yeah well oh. i knew as soon as she started talking about like the energy thing i was like oh i got something yeah, 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 let me tell you about it. <laughs> um, uh, hey, did you, before we move on to the next call uh, all you people what's watching this i'm sure that you're thinking to yourself at this very moment what an amazing show with amazing hosts and, 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 and great producers. I wish that I could support them in all sorts of ways. Well, you can. Uh, there's a, We have a Patreon. You can go to Patreon slash call the line, um, patreon.com slash call the line. Uh, we also have other shows that you can tune into, which I have a list of right here. Um, we've got Dave and Matt on tomorrow. Uh, uh, Dave Warnock and Matt Dillahunty on, I believe that'll be dying out loud. Great show to tune into. Um, on Wednesday, um, I believe is the hang up. We've got Matt and uh, Jeff Blackwell. Um, and this Thursday, we do not have an episode of the Transatlantic Call-In Show. I'm so sorry. But uh, Jimmy will be trying to do some sort of special event uh, for people who don't have anybody to celebrate Thanksgiving with. You can tune into the line and, and hang out with them there. Isn't that a nice, sweet thing to do? Um, so tune into all those things. And also, we have Great a couple of... Oh, my gosh. I, just got, I hear myself. <laughs> You're fine. Um, but I, I also want to say that we have a, a, a couple of theists that have called in and then dropped. We have one on the line that we're about to go to now. But again, I can't stress this enough. You got two scientists here that want to talk to you about life. So if you're a creationist, if you're a theist, if you're an anti-evolution type person, if you're, you're you know, a, a homophobic, transphobic, whatever it is that you want to call in and argue with the usual things we talk about on this show, I was going to say, 
I love that shit, dude. Um, but I, uh, uh, we on this show, we we get a lot of people that call in arguing about about social issues, and we're able to back them up with science as well. This is your not your time to shine. We've yet to be convinced. Maybe you'd be the one. Call us and talk to us about it. The number is seven two zero six one nine two two eight eight. And with that, uh, we're gonna jump over to the next call. Are you ready? Are you good for that? Sweet. We've got Xavier. I don't know if it's Xavier or Javier. I hope you'll correct me. Calling in from Michigan. Uh, says that anyone trying to prove God is silly. And uh, Xavier is a creationist himself. Xavier or Javier, please tell me which one it is. You're on the line. How are you doing? Hi. Uh, it's actually Xavier, although my grandmother is, is Mexican. Okay. So. But yeah, that's why I'm careful. After, like, Charles Xavier. Yeah, I, I live I live here in Oklahoma, and, and we get you know everybody because we have you know, Spanish spelling. So I just want to make sure I'm getting it right. Okay, so Xavier, it says here you're a theist, and you think that it's it's silly to try to prove God. Would you please walk us through first of all what you believe in and why? Because we want to know what God we're talking about, um, and then why you believe that thing would be really help, helpful if you could give it in a summary. We might dig into it more later. And then what are you talking about here about why why it's it's impossible to prove or silly to prove God? Um, well, you said I was a creationist. I'm actually not. It might seem contradictory, but my whole point is um, I believe in... I, I was raised first Catholic. It turned into a cult. It's a really long story that we don't need to get into. But yeah. um, now I, forgive I'm me not if I called you a creationist. I must have... Yeah, forgive me if I called you a creationist. I must have been misspoke and just, just mixed up the terms. I meant to say theist. That's what I've got written here. That's what I was going for. Thank you for calling me out on that. I mean, usually, usually there's not a difference in those two things, but, um, right. Uh, so my, my whole idea is that, um, I, I think it was actually something that you said. I'm actually a longtime fan of you, uh, Forrest, and I'm kind of oh. freaking out talking to you. Uh, <laughs> um, faith and science is completely incompatible. Um, trying to prove God is, Silly, because the whole point is faith, and you're supposed to, you know, uh, take that leap. You're not supposed to. Oh, there's A, B, and C, and this is why. Like, there's there's even a passage where Thomas says, "Oh, well, when I see the wounds in his hands or whatever," and it's like, and they they say, "Well, no, you should believe without seeing," and uh, we actually don't like that here, uh, which is pretty problematic. I don't uh, I don't necessarily think that's a, a good. Uh, basis to form uh, strong opinions on important topics, especially when it comes to the laws and legislation. Uh, I think that can be dangerous. So, um, geez, what am I saying? But uh, yeah, I am, a, I am a theist just because um, I grew up in a cult and now my life is so much less religious than it had started out that um, a lot of Christians today, I feel like, would say that I'm not even technically uh, religious. So, just some understanding. Like, you, you've given us some background into what you believe and why, and I really appreciate that. What it sounds like you're saying is that you acknowledge the fact, that you said specifically that science and faith are incompatible, and that your belief in a deity is not rooted in any scientific understanding, not rooted in evidence, not something that you try to look for reasons for. You just believe it because that's what you're supposed to do. Am I understanding that properly without straw manning it? Uh, almost yes, except for right. me specifically that I believe it because I'm supposed to. I believe it because I choose to. Um, I... I've, ma I've, I've married into a family that's uh, very, um, um, I don't want to say very religious in practice, but uh, they're just very, very faithful, believe in God, very uh, uh, Christian people. But um, they all believe in God because of an experience they've had. They say they've experienced God. I have not up to this point right. in my life. And uh, I still wonder if I ever am going to. And I've come to the conclusion that I may never, but um, I choose to because my family does. And yeah. uh, I, I don't lose anything from it, almost like a Pascal's wager. But I certainly don't think anyone else should uh, change their life for something, certainly 
for something they've never experienced or have reason to believe. So, so I saw Gordon looking there with a, a smile on his face, like he wanted to say something. What, what do you think? Yeah, I, I have a question for you. Um, and this is very dependent on your local laws and regulations and don't go do something illegal. Uh, but have you ever tried magic mushrooms? Because if you would like to have a spiritual experience and maybe commune with a higher power, whether or not that is real, because whatever happens logically is going to be taking place entirely in your head, but you can have a very profound and spiritual experience that might allow you to access those parts of your brain that would help you relate more to your family and the belief system that they've decided to accept because of their experiences. Um, I thought of doing that as, as a role. I don't technically partake. I, I don't particularly uh, take uh, any mind altering uh, substances, um, especially with the way I, I suffered a lot from. I, okay, so I guess yes, I I drink way too much coffee than I need to. That is mind yeah. altering. You, I'm, um, I'm just pointing out to you that you do use mind altering substances all the time, um, yeah. and it's just the value judgments we've placed on certain types of substances. So, just keep that in mind. Yeah, that is true. Um, I would be worried myself. Just that if I were to take something that, uh, I don't know if I could ever walk my uh, fragile mind back from that uh, mind sh shattering. Uh, there, there's, uh, there's, 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 I've way, been there. Yeah, there's a difference between having like a cup of coffee versus shooting an entire bag's worth of caffeine <laughs> into your system at one time. So keep that in mind as well. Many of the ways right. that things are depicted in media make you think that the moment you like have something on your tongue, suddenly the world turns into rainbows and everything explodes. Um, it may not be like that. Uh, I, I, with regards to the right. idea of like God being real or not from a scientific perspective, I'd be completely willing to accept the existence of God. If someone presented really good proof for it. Right. Um, and if, from a scientific perspective, right. when we talk about hypotheses, you can never prove a hypothesis. You can simply prove them wrong. And so it's sort of the absence of other stuff that leads you to propose a model to fit the system. Um, as it stands, Absolutely. we have, for me, a lot of proof that God does not exist, um, or at least that he did not you know, consciously and intentionally create the world because we have millions of years worth of, you know, billions of years worth of geological data um, the universe expanding, the Big Bang, DNA evolution, phylogenetic. We have all of these things that sort of say, well, it doesn't really look like there was some guy who made the Earth in seven days. Um, if someone were to prevent or like present really compelling evidence that that was the case, I'd be willing to reform my hypothesis. But until mm -hmm. that happens, um, as, as my PI in grad school would always say, show me the data. You know, like uh, like Tom Cruise and in that movie with Cuba Gooding Jr. Show me the money, but show me the data. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's that's kind of where I'm at with it. It's um, like it's it's you know, as as Gordon said, you can you can have a psychedelic experience and feel some crazy shit. Um, I've I've done some drugs in my time, and I did them at a time when I was somewhat spiritual and quasi. And I wouldn't call it religious, but like I believed in some shit, and I was oh my glob, I was connected to the whole earth, and I felt the vibrations of the planet beneath me, and I was one with the universe, and it was amazing. And I did them when I was very very atheist and had already deconstructed from all those things, and I felt a lot of the same ways. It was awesome. I just didn't apply this meaning to it that was unjustifiable. I, was, I wasn't looking for a reason to believe anything in particular. I was just enjoying where I was. Um, so I'm certainly not going to encourage anybody to try any drugs unless they really want to and they're a, an adult and blah, blah, blah. I don't get confused. I'm just saying like there's, there's lots of ways for you to feel lots of things. Um, anybody who thinks that going right. to church is like a spiritual experience that unites them with God has never been to a good rock concert and felt the exact same thing. Cause that's what that shit's for. <laughs> like there's, there's lots of ways you can experience these things. None of it actually points to a God. So when you're talking about all oh, your family's had all these experiences, I, I don't, I don't find those experiences valuable. Um, but we're not really talking about them. I guess we are talking about you and, and, and I, I I'll, I'll let you respond to everything we've said first. And then I have a different set of questions for you. Uh, to immediately respond to what you said, but I have something else about the magic mushroom thing. <laughs> sure, sure. 
uh, my father-in-law just the other day said, well, that one time when we were praying together, um, I could tell you, you were feeling something and like something was moving in you. And I said, well, that's not necessarily God because I also got very emotional watching Sean Aston, uh, carry Elijah Wood up Mount Doom and, uh, right. with Howard Shore's music in the background. That was, uh, Frodo yeah, lives. So it's, it's not, <laughs> Frodo is risen. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, so, like, and to that point, uh, taking magic mushrooms to feel something spiritual, it would also be synthetic. It's not necessarily spiritual. I just feel like mm. it is. And um, if yeah. I were to have an experience with God, should he be there? Um, I want it to be um, entirely organic, as it were. Well, not that magic mushrooms aren't organic, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I, I get where you're coming from, and like that's that's kind of where I'm coming back to now. Is that like you you said at the beginning of this thing that you understand that faith and science are are incompatible structures, and you're talking about your belief in God, and and the way you've described it seems like you are very rational about everybody else's beliefs and you're willing to dismiss everybody else's claims for what they are um as as you know pseudoscientific based uh something that's back, backed by their emotion something that's that's supported by their feelings or their misinterpretation of an event or a phenomenon that, that they're assigning meaning to that doesn't belong there like it sounds like you're doing this really well with everything else and i'm wondering why you're not taking that extra step with yourself to say I un, like you. You said yourself, faith is not a scientific endeavor. It's not something that's compatible with scientific, you know, thinking. Why carry the baggage then? Like, why? Why would you make such an expensive demand of yourself to say all the rest of the universe? I'm going to treat this way, but this one question, I'm going to allow myself to have a completely different kind of thinking for. And even when other people try to use that same kind of thinking, I'm not going to allow it. But for me. I'm going to let myself do this thing that I admit and accept doesn't make any sense. Like what, what's the point of that? I, I don't understand. Well, um, I hold that it, I'm, I hold the, uh, right to decide. I don't want to hold to it later. You know what I mean? Like, uh, sure. right now I don't feel you you often quote when uh, I think it was an apocalyptic thing uh, when he get, the guy gathered all of the the science and the of the world and was it Napoleon who said wait why didn't you say anything about God and I had no need for that uh, Lamarck uh, no no pa Pascal it was I think it was Pascal yeah and uh, kind of in a similar way. Laplace. Um, I knew that was wrong, my... Pascal. Fuck me. Laplace. I'm sitting here thinking, like, that's not the name, <laughs> and I look like an idiot right now. Laplace. Yeah, it was Laplace. That, God damn. Sorry. Continue. I apologize. I just I couldn't let that go. I was like, that's wrong. That's so wrong. Yeah, Laplace. <laughs> you, you could have said Marco Polo, and I would have been like, yeah, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's getting it. in the comments real mad. Somebody's deleting a paragraph of how much <laughs> that I'm stupid right now. <laughs> But um, it, it kind of in a similar spirit, um, believing in God does not uh, affect my day-to-day -day life in a negative way, the way it had. Um, I mm -hmm. was raised Catholic and then indoctrinated into a cult started by my dad. <laughs> and right. I even went to the seminary. And in the seminary, uh, the, the illusion was sh sort of shattered. Um, and I realized, oh, um, I was told my whole life that I am broken and a miserable creature who can only be fixed by God. If I go here, that's the closest I can get to God and he can fix me. And then I get there and realize all of these people are assholes. They're all awful, awful people who hate each other and hate everyone else. And I'm like, where do I go? So I deconstructed from Catholicism and I was kind of, um, I don't know, I guess agnostic for a while. And for a bit, I would um, say out loud to myself, like, I think for two days, um, whenever like a concerning uh, religious question came up in my head, I'd say, I'm an atheist. I'm an atheist. Mm. 
because, and that would be like, you know, I don't believe in this. I need to worry about it. But um, I just, after some, a while of trying to be an atheist, I just couldn't stop falling back into this idea that there is a God. But I also have to acknowledge that if I take that leap of faith for a God, that doesn't mean I should throw away what I can see with my eyes. So, so um, evolution, the, the, the big hang up. Yeah, I believe yeah, in that. The, the big hang up that I have here, and I, 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 at risk of repeating myself. So forgive me if this sounds redundant, but like the big hang up that I'm having here is once again, you've described a deconstruction story and you've talked about how you, you, you make special exception for faith in this one instance and you said it doesn't affect your day-to-day -day life, well, then neither would not believing in the thing. So it seems like you've made it this thing that's so small to seem benign, and therefore it kind of leaves this security blanket for you. Like, well, I still kind of believe in this, and it's okay. And I, I guess what... I'm going to play devil's Stanford, advocate, too. Why sure. only one God? Yeah, well, that, that was exactly what I was going to ask. Is, is it like, you know, you're, you're playing this faith game with this thing, the common question we ask on the show is, couldn't you use the same kind of thinking here for any other god or any number of gods? What if I were to say the exact same story, front and back, every single thing that you just said, but I replaced it with, and I just, you know, I believe in this pantheon of, of, of you know, all these different gods, um, and they're totally different than the one you believe in, and, and my pantheon specifically says that your, your god doesn't exist. So I, I just believe something completely incompatible with your belief for the exact same reasons, like why wouldn't that track with you or would it track with you? And then how? Um, I think it is completely legitimate to worship any God or God's plural. Uh, because again, it's for me at this point in my life, it's more of a culture and uh, just a hope, I suppose. Uh, like I said, Pascal's wager. I mean, I feel like Pascal's wager makes sense to an individual making a decision for themselves. It does not make sense as a broad argument like, oh, well, you should. And also, because it's not just a yes or no, it, because the yes also contains follow all of these rules, follow all of those rules, don't eat this, do that, and also right, but, uh, rate the fine. Pascal's wager. Pascal's wager doesn't just apply to a God existing. Pascal's wager also brings with it the extra baggage of a hell existing or a, you know, some sort of afterlife. So you're not just believing in this God. If you're using Pascal's wager, which but we could do a whole thing about why Pascal's wager is a terrible argument. But, but like, <laughs> if you're using Pascal's wager for this, you're not just saying, well, I believe it. And if I believe it and I'm right, then great. And if I believe it and I'm wrong, the, the issue is, that comes with the baggage of if I don't believe this and I'm wrong and God's real, then I'm going to be punished for it. And that brings with it a slew of other issues that you're now assigning yourself to. So I have to ask, do you believe in an afterlife? Do you believe in a heaven and hell? Do you believe in punishment? Do you believe that there are rules to the universe that you have to follow and all these other things that you're sitting here saying you don't believe in? And if not, why the hell would just believing just in case even matter? Um, this is going to get a lot of theists pissed off at me, but that's um, what we, we do it every day. <laughs> it's yeah, it's kind of yeah. bread and butter. Uh, well, I, I'm <laughs> my whole family is theist. Actually, my dad doesn't uh, even talk to me anymore. Uh, but I don't want to talk to him, so it's fine. Uh, sorry to hear we that. We agree on that. Least. <laughs> nah, nah, he's an asshole. <laughs> but um, I don't believe in hell at all really um Great, most like, cultures on earth like don't the honestly hell. there's there's very few that do yeah yeah well i feel like the kind of hell that's espoused by um, mainstream christianity and especially the catholic church is ripped off from dante's inferno um and yeah isn't a lot of times difficult. it is um and for two reasons i don't think um a literal hell is real um one, well, it also uh, didn't if you look at what the Bible says, that's not technically what it is. Hmm? It didn't exist within the history of Christianity until someone made it up. You know, it yeah. was it's not part right. of the yeah, faith exactly. of Judaism. So hell as a concept 
did not appear until they started trying to control people being like bad pay money to the church so you don't go to the bad place tithing you know right. like, if you look at the history of christianity exactly. like, very very quickly in a religion you know history of religion class you'll see like how many things were constructed around modern christianity and how much of that was a, a mechanism to control people especially right. and, and that's the thing, like, what, what, whatever reasons you don't believe in hell i, I guess it's just the the question that i'm trying to drive at here is like why just why is Pascal's wager compelling to you if there's nothing on the line and you're just believing it because you'd like to? Well, um, the other thing, I don't know if this is exactly answering your question. Please don't get mad at me. Um, I was just I'm keeping trying to keep train of my thoughts, track of my train of thought. Yeah. Um, I'm of the opinion. All right. So if I accept evolution, as in the scientific method, uh, what the scientific method in history tells us about the Bible and how it's mm -hmm. been altered and changed throughout history is also true. I don't actually believe most of the Bible, um, or if parts of the Bible are true, they've been heavily interpreted and mean completely different things and used to control people. Uh, religions are started by people who have agendas and they interpret it and tell people what to do so they can control them. Um, and I feel like there's a difference between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Mm -hmm. And if I feel like almost every Christian, maybe except the Westboro Baptist church would say that God or, or Jesus or both, whatever is the most loving being in the world or in the universe, in, in conception. Jesus, or forget Jesus, God cannot be then more loving, more merciful, more empathetic than me. But so, the question for you, does that, is that a mean, safety blanket? Does that make you feel good to think about that? About what? It was a loving God. There being some higher power that cares about you specifically. It actually doesn't make me feel better because I feel like if he did care about me, he would have said something, you know? <laughs> That's pretty cool, right? Uh, like, look, look, I, I uh, feel like... like, like <laughs> oh, I, okay, so I, I, the, we, we've been on this call for about 20 minutes. And I've got to move on. I'm sorry. But like, I, I, I want to ask you one more thing because like, I, I feel like... I've been trying to dance around a point to try to get there. And I feel like we're, we're you, you've given me reasonable answers, but I think you're missing the one thing that I'm driving at here. And the one thing I'm driving at is, do you care about whether the, whether or not the things that you believe are true? Um, I would say I care, but I'm also completely fine with being wrong. Um, well, okay. Well then there's, that's, the, that's, the that's it. Man. That's there's no reason it, it, if, if that's where you're coming from, then there's no reason for you to really strongly care about anything that you believe and that there's no reason for you to try to convince anybody of anything. And I could tell you today that actually there's a, you know, the, the gnomes that drive the moon are the ones that are also controlling politics here on the planet. And you can, Oh, well, I guess I'll believe it because I don't really give a shit if I'm wrong. You know, like, what is there any length that you wouldn't be able to go to with that mentality? Is there anything you couldn't believe? based on the faith that you're espousing and the kind of thinking that you're advocating for here. I, I don't see how you can be comfortable with that kind of worldview. Well, um, like I said, but the, um, the, I think that the, the, the note I put on the call is trying to prove something like that is silly because mm -hmm. I mean, it is God technically the idea of God is silly. But um, I'm in a place in my life where uh, God is a big part of my family, uh, the family I've married into, and the life I've built. And um, so, then, I, so then that's it. Then it's it's a utility. Because my my final question was going to be, what is the use of a belief? that could be absolutely anything and you don't care if it's real or not and you acknowledge the fact that you have no good reason to believe it and that it can't be proved and that it shouldn't be proved 
and you just believe it because you want to believe it because you want to believe it. What's the point? What's the utility of that? And here you've said it. It makes it more comfortable for your family life. It doesn't make any damn sense. You don't care if it makes any damn sense. You just believe it because you want to believe it. And I don't, I, if that works for you, I'm not going to tell you. Though. Right. I, I, I understand that. And that's what actually makes it even more perplexing to me because like, if, I'm not going to tell you how to live your life, dude. If you, you seem like a reasonable guy in all sorts of other ways, your family life is your family life. You do you as long as you're, you, you already mentioned that you're not trying to get religion into legislation and you think that's wrong. So you've sitting well with me in that regard. But like, I, I just, I, I don't know, man, that does not sit well in my mind that you can just choose to believe something that you acknowledge you have no good reason to believe and you could replace it with literally any other batshit crazy belief and have the exact same backing and the exact same consequence for it and it wouldn't mean a damn thing and you're just like, eh, fuck it. You have you, I mean? have you, what are you heard, saying, Have you heard of the, of the flying spaghetti monster? Because I'd highly recommend right. him as a choice of deity. Excellent. Yes. And you can <laughs> exactly. yeah. 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 look spaghetti monster. Cool. Flying yes, spaghetti monster. Yeah. Google it. I, I love I love anti uh, religions. They're hilarious. I yeah, particularly founded the, the church thing. five minutes ago. Yeah, and uh, the, the, I do all the time on the show. I talk about rolling the closet goblin and how we have you know the this goblin that lives in my closet <laughs> and eats subway sandwiches and grants wishes and I. I talk about that with theists all the time. They're like, you can't believe in something like that. And I'm like, I give all the exact same reasons you do. And we have a big argument about it. But here with what you're saying, you would believe in rolling the closet goblin because fuck it, why not? And like, I don't, like, I don't get that. That's just, it's a, that's a wild thing to say suppose, on the air. You know what I mean? I suppose it would be more of a case of do as the Romans do. If Everyone in your family like, believed so in going to cause a goblin. And oh, everybody in really my matter. family was religious, bruh. Uh, my, my wife, when I met her, was, oh, was a Christian. And we, I don't know, man. I, like I said, I'm not going to tell you what to do with your life. That's it. it uh, you, it's fine. But like, I hope if, if because of the show that we're on and because of what I do for a living and because of the platform that I have and the reasons why I have it, I sincerely hope that this is something that you and your family but at least you can face a little bit more realistically. I wouldn't say honestly. You're being very honest about the fact that you have no good reason to believe this shit. I just hope that maybe you take it a little bit more seriously and realize that it's not, you know, whether or not you believe in a thing and whether or not you allow yourself to wrap your head around something does have ripples. It does have ramifications, whether you recognize them or not. And, and that I don't think is worth the baggage that it, it brings with it. But that's just me. Um, Xavier, I'll give you the last right. word and then we got to move on, man. Um, all right. Well, um, as a closing statement, I suppose I would just say uh, I believe the Beatles are one of the most amazing bands in the world. Um, they actually released their last song, which is incredible. Um, but uh, a lot of people I meet say they're not that great and they're overrated. And that's just an opinion I have. Um, I'm not saying like it's allegory is limp. It's obviously. The Beatles were people. We can go back and we can uh, quantify certain things about their existence. But my, my point is believing that the Beatles is the greatest band. And I can have a lot of great reasons for that. Um, but it's honestly, when it comes down to it, just something that I believe in because it yeah, but makes me feel good. There's a big difference between an opinion and a truth claim. And I think, I think, I think you're conflating those on purpose to not, deal with that but that's 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 what i'm reading into it man anyway we're going to move on to the next call but thank you so much for being here xavier please call back if you want to talk more about your beliefs I, I hope he gets yeah oh. you're fine no no we, we, we've dropped the call what's going on okay I, I just hope that he gets to spend some introspective time in nature uh yeah you know there, there's a lot of cooler things if you're looking for something bigger than yourself to believe in there's a lot right. of shit that's fucking real that you can go out and get excited about. Like right. that's, that's the beautiful thing about <laughs> someone in the chat just says, I wish Forrest Malachi was real. <laughs> um, but the, the, that's the thing. There's, there's amazing, like you can go out there and, and really feel connected to the right. universe around you. And, and you don't have to do drugs to do it. Although sure they're fun. Um, but like, it's there's, a, it's a, it's a shortcut to connecting to the profundity of, of things. But yeah, I mean, we, within that same framework, you can spend 
you can spend 20 years meditating in nature and maybe achieve the same goal, or you can spend an afternoon in a field with a little bit of philosophy and you'll get there too. So <laughs> we actually have someone who wanted to ask a question about that and we'll get to them later because we always prioritize theist calls and I've got at least one more here before I get into that. Um, but uh, just so everybody remembers, you know, this is a call in show. We are live at this very moment, um, unless you're watching this when we're not live, in which case we're not. But if you're watching it right now, which isn't later on when you're watching this video, but actually now, then it's it, we're actually live at this moment. And you can call us if you're a theist, if you're a creationist, if you're uh, anti evolution or pro whatever, uh, procreation or whatever, uh, you can hit us up at 720 619 2288 um, and, and, and tell us what you think. Try to convince us because nobody's convinced us yet. Um, with that, we're going to move on to Andrew, pronouns he, him, calling him from Florida, uh, who says that theism is more credible than atheism because theists have more children. I have a million things to say about that, but who knows? Maybe there's a little bit more details in what you actually have to say. Andrew, you are on the line. How are you doing, man? Greetings, gentlemen. Good evening. So yeah, tell uh, us more about well, your, your assertion here. That is, is there more to it, or is that... Call screen line, pretty much sum it up. There's a little more to it. Okay. There's a little more to it. Basically, evolution favors those who have the most children, and the ideology that produces more children, in terms of orthopraxy, seems to be more credible and is going to live out longer in the end. And so it's more likely to be possibly more likely to be true. Uh, so that's a, a massive, massive logical leap there. Um, yes. Whether or not something is useful, let's let, let's grant your premise that theists have more children. The quiverful movement, right, is a, is a theistic thing, um, and and uh, I think there actually is some statistics to to support the idea that atheists tend to have less children. I, I'm not sure, but let's assume that this is all accurate. That doesn't give you shit about whether or not the thing is true. Um, you talk about evolution, and one thing that I've talked about before on this show is you know whether or not religion has some sort of evolutionary backing to it. Gordon mentioned earlier that humans are really good at seeing patterns and things. Um, this apophenia and paradelia are our way of looking at meaningless data and trying to see patterns in it and derive meaning from those patterns, none of which actually exist. Those are evolutionary, evolutionarily advantageous traits. Because if you're out on the savanna and you hear a rustling in the bushes and you assume it's the wind and it's actually a tiger, you're lunch. But if you assume it's a tiger and it's actually the wind, all you did was get a good workout running away from nothing. Um, it's Pascal's wager works when you're out in the wilderness being hunted by bears and shit, right? Um, and so the the that line of thinking, it does make us more likely to see patterns, but it doesn't necessarily mean those patterns are actually there. And we see the same thing with religion. If you want to say religion causes more children and that leads some evolutionary advantage and therefore there's some evolutionary backing to religion i wouldn't believe you but let's if that was real sure there's an evolutionary backing for religiosity that doesn't tell you anything about the truth claim whether or not that tiger actually exists whether or not that god actually exists gordon what are you thinking uh i was gonna say have you seen the movie idiocracy because yeah, that, exactly. that is out of a pretty good case. Um, the, the thing that I, the biggest issue I have with your argument is simply that having more children is evolutionarily advantageous because that's not always true. A lot of species make more children than is necessary so that they can lose some. And that has become an evolved evolutionary trait for stuff like rodents. But in a lot of cases, having more children is not better. And so with most bird species, I mean, like the uh, blue-footed boobies or something on the Galapagos, they might have two chicks. Only one survives. They mm -hmm. have two, so that in case one dies, they've got an extra one, but ultimately they will only feed and raise one child. So it's not, in that sense, it's evolutionary advantageous to have one more, but it's only because the other one's going to die. Um, and yeah. in the movie Idiocracy, I would make the case that lots of dumb people having lots of dumb kids leads to a dumb society that cannot then care for itself and fails in the most basic premise of trying to water plants with Gatorade, basically. Yeah, the, yeah. so that's that's the thing. Is it, it really, it's not just having more children, it's having more children that live. That's that's the evolutionarily the, uh, advantageous thing. And you know, uh, yeah, fit, Jordan talks fit, about- Evolutionarily fit children, not just more children. Yes. And I would argue yeah. that if you're having a ton of kids and they're not getting educated, 
and they're in this tiny little insulated community not experiencing reality, those are not fit adults or fit children that will help our society progress. Yeah, that, that, that's a good one. Uh, I uh, love the idea of talking about R selection versus K selection because I never get to do that with anybody, but that is what Gordon's talking about. And if you want to be real, real excited, go look up R versus K selection and look up the reproductive strategies that are prevalent through ecology and evolution. Super cool shit. Totally different thing. We'll get to it in the super chat. Somebody send in a $10 super chat asking for just to explain R versus K selection so we can talk about it more. Anyway, Andrew, uh, does that answer your question? Do you have anything to contend with what we're saying? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, a, a lot there makes sense. Um, but, but something that Gordon said, that having more children isn't necessarily better or worse, that's a value mm -hmm. judgment. But uh, like evolution favors those who pass down their genes the most or those who pass down their ideas. Right? The, the best ideas get passed down the most. And that, that's the essence of my argument. And, and so not, it's not the religious claims that are the best ideas, but religion itself um, being something that evolution favors and tends to pass down more. And one example to give an argument, uh, to support the argument, will be Catholic education. Catholic education in all states, are most Catholic kids are two grade levels above um, public school kids in their academics. Do you have a source for that? Yeah. I if I were to believe that, like, like we can assume that's true, why? Is it because private schools tend to have more resources and smaller class sizes and more, you know, uh, precise learning affluent, with the teacher? Affluent one, one parents. Point. Affluent yeah. parents that can afford tutors. And like, is, do you think that maybe the societal factors of being able to go to a society, to a private Catholic school might have more to do with the Catholic education system? Or do you think that because these people are religious, they're somehow doing better? Assuming the, what you well, said is what, the, what, the, the first part. The first part of what you said that could be that could that could be a factor. Um, Catholic mm -hmm. kids tend to have more money, right? They can afford private school. Another factor is religiosity itself. It's an added component into the curriculum, into the formation of the person. So they don't just focus on their academics, but their, their social and emotional um, health. Um, as and incorporated into the religious ed education, the source is from News Nation. They, they did a whole story on it. And Bill Maher, a cultural commentator, even he's an atheist, but he commented on that as well. Uh, like just, so just like, you a, like a week or two ago. Based on what you just said, like I have to ask: Do you think that secular education doesn't or can't enforce people in a social and emotional way and and, and provide social and emotional learning for children? Do you think that only comes from religious education? It, it, it could do it, but it cannot do it as well because it lacks the religious component. Why can't you teach children what religion is and give them a cultural humanities background without teaching them that the religion is true? Wouldn't be, that be the same kind of component, only without the baggage of having the religious belief? You could. You, universities do it. They have religion classes. Um, they yeah, are optional. I, I, but, I never took a religion I mean, class, but I did take several humanities classes, did a lot of anthropology. I studied a lot of cultures and religious and belief systems around the world. It made me a more rounded person. And I was an atheist the entire time. So why wouldn't that be an issue in public school education? Because when you're integrating religion, you're, you're, you're forming a cultural identity. You're, you're turning the person more into just a scholar. You're integrating uh, uh, the power of the religion itself into that, into the for, forming the person. And you could do it without it, like you, you're, just, you're stating. But so you're so are you just, arguing it, it for religious based on the data? It sounds like you're arguing for indoctrinating kids with religion so that they'll have more kids and then create more adults that want to have more kids to also indoctrinate them, which again has nothing to do with evolution. It's simply a societal construct. So I'm a little confused about what your argument uh, is here. Yeah, uh, yeah. let me try to get to my original point. Um, through sure. orthopraxy, you can see that ideas are more likely to be true if they're more functional in the society. Like, no. Whatever seems to be working seems to be the more true. That, that's no. the no. essence of my argument. Very no. that is untrue. 
empirically no, that's you, not true. Like in yeah. testing, whatever whatever airplane gets on the gets on the air, that's the one that works. Well, that's the math that's correct. That's a very right. different claim. Saying whatever works and is more prevalent in society must be true versus saying whatever airplane flies is a functional airplane are two very different things, and you're drawing a comparison between them that you needn't draw. Whatever works in society is whatever works in society. There's cultural reasons behind it. There could be authoritarian reasons behind it. There could be a traditional thing going on there. There could be, there's a lot, you know, there's the old story of, uh, you know, a, a mother is preparing a Christmas ham and cuts the end off of the ham. And the daughter asks, why do you do that? And she said, well, because my mother always did it. And they ask the grandma, why do you cut the end off the ham? Well, my mother always did it. And they go call the great grandma. Why do you cut the end off the ham? And she said, because it wouldn't fit in the fucking pan unless I did that. And so this is you know, this generational thing that makes no difference. It makes no sense, but it's a societal norm. And it's the same thing with lots of things that we do in our society today. There's lots and lots of cultural practices that we have that have no real reason to, be, to exist. They're just things that we've done for a long time that we collectively assume are good manners. There's a reason why, you know, in, in, in one part of the world, if you hand something to somebody with one hand, it's a much worse thing. It's disrespectful. And I believe it's in, in China and Korea. I think I, I don't know for sure, but like in there's a couple of Asian countries I know for sure that if you hand something to somebody with one hand, it's considered disrespectful. And you're supposed to use two hands. Does that mean that there's more value to panning something with his own two hands because everybody's doing it? And if not, why not? You know what I mean? It's the same thing here. Just because you know, the, the 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 traditional Jewish practice of putting water over your hands before a meal is a good thing because microbiology exists no matter what your religion is. Washing your hands before a meal and the efficacy of that practice tells you nothing about the truth of the Jewish religion. Similarly, you know, whether or not you have a bunch of kids, which you can argue whether or not that's a good thing, has nothing, no basis, no bearing on whether or not the God claim itself is true. I, you're just making this massive jump here and you've been making it the whole time and I don't see how you don't see it. Hmm. Yeah, I guess I don't see it. Um, so so l l the, let me try the this. Way you're framing let's it. say, let's turn it the exact opposite way around and say that for some reason, more atheists are having children all of a sudden. All the atheists in the world have a big old orgy and have lots of kids. Do you stop believing in God because it's more prevalent to have children when you're an atheist? If atheism produces a more functional society, then I would I would have to say atheism has more credibility to it than God. So it's probably I have to lean more towards atheism than theism. Okay. Andrew, do you think Let's we do, have, do you think we have a functional society now with looking at where we're at? politically, economically, climate-wise, are you happy with where our country's at right now? Because we are living in a patriarchal religious society, and that has been the overarching you know, foundation of America. So if you're happy with the way things are right now, then that is true. But if you're unhappy with any aspect of the way that things are right now, then that is empirically not true, just from a logical standpoint. Um, our society's a melting pot. I don't know if it can support secularism or religiosity it seems to have a have we have control. we ever had an atheist president no so yeah but it seems to fall in that religion in name though they're not very they're rarely have we had a, a devout president right they're mostly like okay yeah religion you know i believe in god but they're in their lives they're mostly secular that's the complaint right, that's, that's what i mean the the thing that I'm grappling with here the most is you're saying that like it religion makes your society more functional and we have this amazingly functional society. But when you compare the United States, which is a deeply religious nation, to any secular country, pick your favorite, you know, Norway, Sweden, Finland, uh, 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 Japan, you know, whatever uh, you pick, pick any of these more secular countries they do better than us in pretty much every conceivable metric. 
um, the United States has more prisoners per capita than any country in the history of the world. We have the least free, the most incarcerated population. 25% of all the prisoners in the world are prisoners here in America. Is that a functional society to you? These other secular countries have lower incarceration rates, lower teen pregnancy rates, higher rates of education, better rates of, of, of higher education, especially. Um, they have uh, uh, lower suicide rates. They uh, Citizens report overall more happiness, lower rates of obesity, lower rates of drug use. All of these magically amazing things that we strive for here in America are reality in more secular countries. And here in America, we're squalling in the mud and we're all religious. So where are you getting this idea that we're somehow more functional, better society because of our religiosity? That the, the data or, don't or that a, a more or a more religious society would be even better. Look at some of exactly. the most religious like countries in the world. Um, I'm not going to point fingers at anything, but there's a general whole <laughs> middle part of the world. There's a lot of very religious people that are ruled by the religious. Uh, minority and those countries are not doing better. In fact, they're probably doing right. worse. Right. So how I, do you I grapple with what that? Forrest was doing. Yeah, I, I appreciate what Forrest was doing. I kind of wasn't seeing the, the gap. So he's kind of using my, the logic of my argument and giving counterexamples. I, I do appreciate that. It, it's making it easier to understand. Um, he's looking at the flaws of, of American society. And, and so I, I would, I, I don't know, I would simply say that America it's the world's reserve currency. They, they, it, it's the, it has the most influence over the entire world. Um, but I, I don't know if they're more religious or more secular. That's, that's why I can't really, it, it, it's, it's, it's too complex to say it's more religious or less religious. Um, 80% of kids are in public school. That's irreligious. So I don't know. Well, about well, that, no, but well, hold on there. I've, species, I've worked around public religious. schools for most of my life. The, they may be secular by law, but I promise you they are not secular in practice here in the United States. And even if they were, those kids still have lives outside of school. And right now, I live in Oklahoma. I've moved several times here in Oklahoma. I have never once, including right now, lived in a part of Oklahoma where there weren't double-digit churches within walking distance of my house. So, like, we live in a very religious society here. And yes, it is a melting pot, and we have a, a, a heterogeneity of the religions that are here, but we are very, very religious, and evangelical Christianity is the dominant religion both in our political and our social landscapes. So for what you're saying to make any sense, it would have to stand to reason that secular societies score worse in all the metrics that I talked about, and that theocracies are actually the best, most functional, stable societies in the world. And I don't think that you would be willing to say that with a straight face. I hope you wouldn't. No, no. No, no. I, I know failing theocracies. And... Right. So, get, get, like, I'm if, just, if what you're saying is true, wouldn't it make sense to then also say that theocracy would be the best form of government? Um... Uh, most people, no, no, most people do not think that's the best form of government. What do not you authoritarianism. think? Authoritarianism. What do you think? Is theocracy the best form of government? The best form of government. No. Why not? No. If enforce, if if enforcing the religion, if if everybody has to be religious and the education is religious and includes all these things. And then they all have lots of kids because it's a Catholic society and you're not allowed to use contraception or whatever the hell else it is. It doesn't have to be Catholic specifically. Wouldn't that be better? Wouldn't that be the most functional society? We've already tried that. I'm asking you, if what you're saying is true, wouldn't that be the logical conclusion of what you called in to, to argue here? It would be the logical conclusion. I, I, I guess. Yeah. So then, do you support theocracy? And can you point me to any one theocracy that has ever worked? In the modern age, Saudi Arabia seems to be working. But 
is Saudi Arabia I mean, that, the is that, is that really what you want to use as your example of a society that's working? Are you it, aware it, of their it, human, it, rights it, it, human rights violations and as much and as the China, role of women in society? No, no, it, and, it is extreme. It so is an extreme very form extreme. of authoritarianism. It's probably one of the most extreme governments in the entire world, and they kill journalists yeah. on a regular basis. So. I'm I'm just looking up. I just found like this is the first source that I found. It might not even be a good source. Who knows? But this random Google search is saying that Saudi Arabia is more of a monarchy. Iran is specifically a, supposed to be a theocracy with to a some Iran democratic. Was, I was, what I was thinking about the biggest sort of yeah. main theocracy in the world. It's a yeah. So here's another one from yeah, another person saying that Saudi Arabia is an Islamic monarchy, not a theocracy. Which you could split hairs, I guess. It doesn't matter. But like Iran seems to be a, a modern. Let's just double check really quickly. Uh, uh, modern theocratic uh, countries and see what comes up. So uh, theocracies. Yeah, here we have Iran, I, Afghanistan. Right. It says Armenia. I don't know about that. But do these sound like the kind of countries that you you would want to live in that are being super successful? I wasn't, that are. I wasn't I wasn't trying to get into forms of government. Um, you know, but I you did when you called. Church and state. I was just talking about religiosity. Why do you uh, believe you know, in the separation of church and state? About. Why do you believe because in the separation of church and state if more religion is better? Because you're forcing others to live in, in, according to your interpretation of religion. and that's What do you that's, think that's, happens and, and when people send their kids to Catholic school, school, Andrew? Andrew. What do you think happens when people send their kids to Catholic school? Do you not think that they're being forced to believe in the one kind of religion that their parents are raising them to believe in? It's enforcing it's your beliefs on hallmark. others is kind of what religion has done in our country. It's kind of the yeah, hallmark of the whole fucking it. thing, right? Kids, you, kids are not forced. So you say, it's like saying we're forced to obey the law. Like, that's a strong word. When kids go to school, they're not being coerced into religion. Like, we're not coerced into learning math and science. Like, that's a strong word. It, it's, it, religion has a heavier influence in Catholic schools than public schools. But I would not use the word forced. L let me like, try like, a different talk, angle because I don't want to get... Theocracies, and that is forced. Let me try a different angle. Let me just try, try something different because I, I feel like we're going to get into semantics here and I want to move on because we've been on call for about 20 minutes. So let me just try a different thing really quickly is you keep talking about how religious societies are better and how more religiosity makes for a better, a better place to live and everything. And we, you know, obviously getting that drawing the logical conclusion out of that isn't sitting well with you. So let's try right now in the most religious parts of the world, including America, do, how does that work out for women and for LGBTQ people? Is the society better for them? Society is... Is society better for them? They're doing better in countries that allow these freedoms. And, and that's is the allowing of those freedoms a religious practice or a secular practice? It's a secular practice. So where, what are we are doing? There are religions that are progressive. There are religions that are progressive. Religion can be progressive and fight for. Are you advocating for any of those convictions? Are you advocating for any of those? Because so far, the main example you've given of your convictions here is Catholic school, which is kind of historically not progressive. Yeah, the, the Catholic Church has a lot of progressive stances, and there are other stances that are behind on the times. Like, so religion can so, be progressive. Here we are again. Elements. There are many. Here we are again. What do you think is better? For a society, is it the religious one? 
that says, this is what the book says. This is what the leaders say. This is what we've been doing for thousands of years. It's going to be this way. And maybe someday kicking and screaming, will drag it into the 21st century and it'll eventually get more progressive. Or do you want to live in a society where the laws and the regulations and the way that we do things is thought out and argued and debated and discussed and you, to, to steal the line right. from Richard Dawkins, intelligently designed, where we actually come right. up or, with this just together even, in a secular way. Right. Equitable. Everyone should have an equal yes. shot. And people right. shouldn't be risen above each other because of their status one way or the other. Like, yeah, do you, do you think sorry. that maybe that secular... Do you think that secular society is better... That. Because I'm trying, to, I'm trying to ask you, and forgive me, I know I'm rambling a bit. I just want to make sure I really drill this home so there's no misunderstanding between us. Do you think that the secular society that thinks these things through and gives everybody the same opportunity, the same rights, the same privileges, the same protections is better? Or do you think that a more religious society is better and that somehow will become progressive eventually? And Saudi Arabia is an example of a great flourishing society of, of progress. What do you think? I think, in my personal opinion, the best elements of religion will eventually be more progressive than even secular societies. Because also because of secularism, they will adopt the best practices of secularism and, and religion will, will make it better. And I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a friendship that goes hand in hand and 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 i think the best elements of both that's what's winning out at the end that's my honest answer because I what, one like more i mean it's china they're super secular and they're horrible right so, yeah yes you're right there are secular countries that are horrible you can point to evil atheists all day long you cannot point to evil atheism you cannot tell me any good thing that a religious person can do or say because of their religion that an atheist could not also do or say. However, you can come up with a mil, you should be able to very easily come up with dozens of examples of evil, hideous, heinous, antisocial, terrible things that a religious person would do because of their religion that an atheist would never do because of atheism. No one's ever gone out there and committed mass murder or bombed a bus because they're atheist and they wanted to prove atheism that doesn't make any sense and like I china's, can't, china's I also wanna... not a great example because it's so secular because everyone just follows the cpp that is the religion right the, right. the communist party there's, they there's a rid lot of religion there. so there would be no competition for that authority it, it's it's like with uh, with stalin you know you come into a situation where you the people believe that the leader of the state is a minor god you'd have to be stupid to not take advantage of that so like, it's the same th it, the it, what's blowing my mind the fuck away andrew is that like earlier on you you talked about saudi arabia and i just i i looked it up you know this is from amnesty international last year they committed 148 uh uh pers oh, let's see here sorry are these human rights violations uh, uh, executing 81 individuals a day, the largest mass executions in years. Like there's, there's like, I'm, I'm looking up like just lists, scores of human rights violations here. And it's because this is a religious country that's following religious law, that's hurting people because of their religious beliefs. You don't find that in a secular worldview. And like, I, I, just, I can't wrap my mind around how you can sit here and say that, yeah, well, things aren't great for women. Things aren't great for LGBT people. And yeah, the, you know, the, the most theocratic countries in the world certainly aren't, you know, beacons of humanitarianism or, or, or progress or, or anything. But really, religion is kind of a good thing, except for when it exists. And then it's, it's really important that it, it goes hand in hand with secularism. And like, it seems to me like from the beginning of this call to now, you've just kind of chipped away more and more and more and more of what you're saying to the point where now religion is just this pretty flower in the garden as opposed to the basis of a society. And I'm wondering if you can reconcile with that at all. Yeah, I'm conceding to all the negative aspects. I'm, you know, I'm not denying any of those. So I, I, I can give me any of the same as I possibly can. 
Can you give me any of the same negative aspects in terms of a secular society? Wow. There are, there are t secular societies can be the opposite of progressive. It, it, just because it's secular doesn't mean by definition it is good and progressive. It depends on which secular ideas are the most, enhance humanity the most. Uh, so, it, it, sorry, if you want an ex I'm sorry, example, you want an example? Yes. Okay, uh, with, with, without the religious idea that we are inherent, we have inherent human rights, anybody could just take them away in secular societies. We give those rights, therefore, we can take them away. I think that's a negative, uh, that's a, a huge negative aspect in secular societies. We created those rights. Whereas the religious you, concept of, oh, God give us these rights, they cannot be taken away. Do you honestly, and I mean this, I, I recognize how shitty this sounds, and I don't apologize for it, because I, I need you to really be serious with me. Are you honestly suggesting that without religion, we would not understand that human beings have natural rights, and we wouldn't have a concept of human rights? Is that really what you're trying to tell me here? We do have a concept of human rights without religion. Yes. Yes. So what are you talking about? With religion, you get the idea that it is inherent, objective, and God-given. With secularism, it can be taken away. It, it, we invented it. That's, my, that, that, that's what I meant. That's what I'm saying. So follow-up question. The Spanish Inquisition. How much Nobody did they respect? <laughs> okay. Right. How much did they respect okay. God-given human rights, Andrew? They did not. How much does so, so any religious society respect God-given human rights? Can you give me one example of a deeply, deeply religious society that, because of their religious beliefs alone, has particular respect for the human rights of people? Or more freedoms, wow. because or more I'd freedom, like sure, to know yeah. a religious society that has more freedom than a secular society. In general, yes. secular societies seem to be more be free. Because of their religion. None of this, yeah, well, he secularism did it, but religion was important because it was there. I'm talking about because of their religious beliefs. Can you give us an example of these things? Um, I cannot. I cannot. I would have to look it up. And right. I, don't, and I might be biased if I do. So, I think you are. Um, a, lot, like a lot of great points. A lot of great points. So th this, what I'm, I'm hoping we've getting, gotten across here is that you keep talking about how religion is this important part of the world. And what I hope you're seeing, and I, the last thing, one of the last things you said a little bit ago is that secularism and religion go hand in hand to make a great society. It seems to me like progressive thought is driving society ahead in spite of religious thinking not because of it. I wonder, like, that, that's pretty much my thesis statement for this whole thing, is that it, it, it's against religion's wishes. And then eventually religion catches up and says, okay, yeah, well, we do that. But eventually, the church says, we're going to welcome in gay people because, you know, we're a loving church, because the church has to stay in business. They didn't want to do that. They have to keep it up. What when, are you thinking, Gordon? When did the Catholic Church um, publicly apologize for helping the Nazis? Did they question. ever publicly apologize for that? Because they did. They 100% did. Mm -hmm. That was actually, I believe it was the first treaty that the Nazis ever signed was with the Catholic Church, wasn't it? Yeah. Literal Nazis. <laughs> so that's, that's the history of, of religion. Just, you know, just a little snippet of it. Okay. All right, does, uh, does that do anything to shake up your claims here? Is that does that give you any any pause to what you're saying at all? It does. It does. All cool. the negative aspects. Um, so. it's, it's, I want to come back to one thing you said in the beginning too. Yeah, it's, it's what you're talking about having more kids and evolution is also those things are not related in any way, shape, or form. Uh, yeah, that's go ahead. That, that's the thing, man. Is it like it's. It's kind of been like over the course of this call, it's been claim after claim after claim after claim after claim that's completely unsubstantiated. And 
what like I, I just I wonder if this is anything that like are you willing to change your mind in in the course of this because I hope you understand we're not we're not just giving you some negative aspects here we're directly countering the things that you're saying are true it's, so it's not like me just shitting on religion it's what you're saying doesn't stand up to reality and in fact it seems that the inverse is true does that resonate with you at all do, are you willing to to change your mind on any of this or do you think that we haven't been convincing i'm willing to change my mind i i, I gotta go back to the call and you know re-listen because it's a lot that you guys said so okay cool well andrew okay. i appreciate, appreciate your time i appreciate you, listening. you you've had a yeah, it, I, I, I think you've had a very honest conversation with us, and I really do appreciate that sincerely. So thank you so much for hey, tuning in, hey, man. Andrew, and quick question. Do you know what this mushroom is? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to learn one thing when you talk to us. At least this is a non-religious thing. This is called Amanita muscaria. It's the Mario mushroom. Now you're done. You nice. <laughs> there you go. Fun mushroom facts. Uh, thanks so much, Andrew. Seriously, please call us back again if you want to talk about this some more. Ooh, I'm going to take sort of a beeping going on quick, there. Um, yeah, I'll refill this? for oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, 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 there we go. Uh, this is not an ad for this company. It's just a beer. I was going to say, not, uh, not a sponsor. No, I, I mean, I like this. I like this brewery. But no, what I'm getting at is um, beer is made by fungi. Yeast is a fungi. Truth. And did you know that, that our skin is covered, covered in yeast, different kind of yeast? Mm -hmm. uh, but yeast on our skin is what causes both dandruff and like Tanea Versicolor, like the lightning rash, like Jack Michael Jackson had. Huh. Quick little thing. I love that. Fans. I did a whole thing about, I, I made a video uh, recently over on my channel that was just called uh, Bread. And it was just the science of bread for like 30 solid minutes. Bread. And I did, there was a whole section in there about fungi, about yeast. Um, and like, that was the one part that I found a lot of the time in the comments, people were the most taken aback. But it's, it's a mushroom and it's eating the, the carbohydrates in the bread to make gas. And that's why it rises. What? And I, I think I said it like the, the, as we take plant goo and it becomes increasingly alcoholic as it swells with fungus farts. And we call that rising or something like that. It just, ah, oh, it's wild. Basically that's a, that's a good line. It's a good line. Uh, <laughs> interestingly, bread yeast and wine yeast are more similar to each other than they are to like beer yeast. Nice. Just from there's, an evolutionary standpoint. Yeah, there's also in the, the, the it's the same kind of yeast and the same kind of fermentation that does uh, makes uh, ethanol that we use in cars, right? Well, let me do that with like corn and sugar. Yeah, cane, that's, I, I mean think. that's biofuels. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's usually what they do is they soak a bunch of corn and then they add a ton of amylases, which is the same enzymes that's in our saliva or that some yeast put into breads to help break down the starches. So they've engineered in amylase enzymes to these yeasts, and then they use that in a corn mash to slowly, uh, if you give them all the sugar and have them convert that mm -hmm. all the alcohol at once, they wouldn't be able to get as high as if you give them a little bit of sugar by a little bit of sugar. And so mm -hmm. you build them up and then they can ferment up to about 18, 19% alcohol, which is very high. Most wines don't go that's above about 14, 15. Uh, and so that's part of how they push the biofuels up that high and they're able to distill, distill that off. I was wondering if they were able to like distill it and then re-ferment the leftover mash or something like that to kind of can make sure you get the highest yield out of the carbohydrates that are there or the sugars that are there. They don't re-ferment it, but what they do is they dry it out and then sell it as distillers grains to um, as oh. cattle feed, really high quality cattle feed. And after distill, after like fermentation, it actually I think it's better for the cow microbiome, it produces less methane and stuff like that. Right on. You don't have to punk a hole in a cow. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that. If you're if you're watching this, go go look up videos of cows with bloat, and you literally have to punch a hole in the side of them and drain them like a fucking airbag. It's horrible. Um, at, at, at UC yeah. Davis, they always had cows that has a um, a big hole in the side. They put a window. You can look inside mm -hmm. of a cow at the vet facility. They have it all the time. That's wild. That's so wild. Um, we've got a couple other calls left, and then we'll jump into super chats. Uh, the first call is from Oliver, pronouns he, uh, sorry, pronouns they, them. Uh, if I was looking at the wrong line there. Uh, Oliver, pronouns they, them, uh, calling in from the Northeast. Uh, maybe it means New England. Maybe it means uh, something else. I don't know. I just, it says N-E. Um, uh, says that they were never taught evolution in school and would like to know where to begin researching the topic. Oliver, you are on the line. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I am awesome. Um, so, Really quickly, uh, would you like to just tell us, because it says here that you're a theist, 
And I want to dig into that a little bit, but I don't want to like come at you with that same kind of energy as I normally would. So just tell us like a little bit of your background, please. No, no, and yeah, and, and yeah. What, ex what exactly you're asking for. Absolutely. So because this is a binary, I can't say I'm in a gray area. The culture is really nice and explain that to me. Um, I was raised in a very, very theistic household. Um, my whole life, I was homeschooled for the first like six, wait, not six, first like 11 years of my life. And then I was in a Christian private school. Um, and so I was literally never taught evolution except for the things that were like, oh, well, evolution is not real because we're obviously not fish or evolution right. isn't real because we don't see that happening still today. Um, and so I basically, I just have questions over a couple different things. Um, and I don't need in-depth answers. It could literally be just, you should look into this concept. You should read this book. Yeah. You can look at this article. Um, because I'm working my that way is... through all of this and your channel has actually been a huge help to me, but the more I watch, Thank the more you. questions I have. Um, so I just need That's help how figuring learning goes. this out a little bit. That's the best. That's the best. I love that. By the way, to all the people in the chat saying Nebraska, don't fucking gaslight me. Nebraska isn't real. Uh, it's Northeast. <laughs> um, so yeah, go go ahead and uh, uh, tell us your specific yeah, question because yeah, that's what we're here for. For sure. Yeah. Um. So um, my first question is actually over Noah's flood because last week I was listening to Skep Talk with Erica and Gutsick. Um, and they were talking about like the heat problem, but then Erica rambled off a list of other problems um, with the flood, but I don't totally understand them or what they necessarily mean. Um, and so she I, I, mentioned I give you a litany uh, the of problems myself. and lithification of limestone, um, the hardening of magma, the continental like movement, and then how they would have to speed up the radioactive decay. And that had to happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Bible says it's 40 days and 40 nights, but I've heard it's a year. But all of that is like, I, I don't understand how all of that like works. So I kind of need more yeah. like guidance on what to look into for those or what those even mean. So I would, can, can I, would I ask say, you one question for context? One sec yeah. first. Do you yeah, think fine. Noah's flood is related to evolution? I don't. Uh, it was just the first question okay. I had on my list because the next three are all in relation to okay. something to do with evolution. Okay. Shoot. Yeah. Nick, okay. Just want to make sure. Yeah. Um, so one, one thing uh, that's important, um, you're talking about uh, uh, radioactive decay and all these other things. Um, oh, my brain stopped. I had two things and now I only have one of them. We'll just go into what radioactive decay is and hopefully I'll come back to the other one. Um, is that, uh, uh, so what, what uh, she was talking about there um, is that uh, radioactive decay, what that means is that sometimes heavy elements, um, you know the shape, the structure of an atom is, right? How it's got protons and neutrons. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so different flavors of atoms um, can come in different varieties that we call isotopes. So the species of atom, what kind of atom it is, whether it be carbon, nitrogen, uranium, fluorine, whatever, that's entirely dictated by how many protons it has. But they can have a variety of numbers of neutrons, and those are what we call isotopes. So different isotopes of carbon can have either six, seven, or eight neutrons, right? Um, and so... Uh, you've got these different numbers of neutrons sometimes make certain atoms unstable. Um, and when they're unstable, they, 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 they have too many neutrons, too few neutrons or whatever, they break apart into smaller atoms and they give off energy. And that's called radioactive decay. And there's a couple of different ways that can go on. There's alpha, beta, and gamma decay, that, there's different types of things coming off of it. The point is the atom breaks down. And so when we talk about, for example, helium, right? The element helium, the one that blows up party balloons. We get helium here on this planet from the radioactive decay of uranium. When uranium goes through what's called alpha decay, it poops out two protons and two neutrons, which just so happens to be the nucleus of a helium atom. And then those go out and that's, we get, we get helium from this. Um, the thing is that process generates heat. It releases energy in the term form, form of heat. So if you look at, for example, the moon, Look up, look up at the moon and you'll see there's a lot of light parts and a lot of dark parts. The lightest parts of the moon are the youngest parts of the moon. And the dark parts are new rock that was formed through volcanic eruption. And that happened because when the moon broke off, you know, a big <laughs> asteroid, big planetesimal chunk of, of rock hit Earth, knocked off this big chunk of rock about the diameter of North America. That's what created the moon. Um, this rock 
went through a lot of radioactive decay very quickly. It didn't have a molten core. Then it was just, just cooling off and, and going through decay. And that created a lot of heat and that created volcanoes. And for a little while, the moon was very volcanically active, pooped out magma all over the place. So you can see the results of radioactive decay up there. Um, I can give you 30 other cool examples of radioactive decay, but I'll only give you one more so you can have something else to lock onto. If you have a smoke detector in your house, that works through radioactive decay. Um, you've got a little piece of an element called americium inside there, and it's uh, shooting off the same alpha particles, those same helium nuclei. It's decaying constantly. And you have a little detector on the other side, bump, 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 and it's bumping these particles or bumping into that detector all day long. The thing about these particles is they're very big and clunky. Um, and so when smoke gets in there, it blocks those particles from hitting the detector. When the detector isn't detecting any particles anymore, that's what sets off the alarm. So like there's, there's this decay that's going on around you all the time of heavy elements breaking down into lighter elements. It's always happening. Um, and because it gives off heat, what Erica's talking about there is that if the earth was as young as people, as these creationists are saying that it is, that much radioactive decay that would be necessary, that we can observe and prove has happened in that little bit of time would be so much heat, it would be like detonating 10 nuclear bombs per square centimeter of the planet. It's, it's an absurd amount of heat that would vaporize this entire place, not just be molten, it would be gone. Um, so that's what she's talking about there. And when she's talking about, you know, uh, the lithification of continents, that's something that comes along after what we call the Hadean period, as the Earth is cooling down from its magma-like beginnings, where it's all these things pummeling together, all these things glomming together. The Earth was hot and molten, and then it cooled down, and it took a few million, hundreds of millions of years for the continents to cool enough to form that process in that short amount of time. Insane. The amount of heat needed to, to, to be, be produced in this time. Insane. The amount of heat that needs to be removed in order to allow Earth to not be gone today. Insane. It's just all these layers of frustration. And I have a million other questions, too. Even assuming that that wasn't the case, you can go watch on my channel. I did a, a thing called, um, it's like Floods and Fossils or something like that. It was an episode of Reacteria where I was talking about these people that were trying to prove Noah's Flood. And there's, I have had a whole litany of questions in there. How did all the plants survive? They were underwater for, for you know, a month. Um, how did all the, the um, uh, uh, fish and, and whatnot survive when all the oceans were side diluted with, with, salt, with fresh water and all the fresh water was mixed into the oceans? And like, how did, how did that happen? You know, what, what did all the other animals do to deserve being drowned? You know, there's, I have a million other questions there. And that reminds me of the thing that I was going to say at the beginning, and then I promise I'll shut up, uh, which was that 40 days and 40 nights is kind of just like a colloquialism in the Bible. It just means a long fucking time. Um, it doesn't necessarily always specifically actually mean that much time. But that is another conversation for another day, and that is my initial answer. Does that answer your question, Oliver? Yes. Sick. Gordon, please ramble for at least as long as I have. <laughs> Okay, um, so my next You're... question, um, I hear a lot Hold of on. people saying, well, evolution can't be true because we're constantly losing genetic information. And when I tried to look that up, I'm pretty sure my computer also is like a Christian because it's also bringing up all of these things that are from that. But I've heard other people say that we're not necessarily losing it, but that the information is changing and that like our genotype is expressing it differently. Um, and I don't really... I can't get a clear answer and I swear my laptop's a Christian, but uh, I just, is that true? Do we lose information? Does it change? How does that play into evolution? So, I'm going to write that question well, down. Jordan was muted and I want to hear what he had to say and then I'll come back yeah, to that because yeah, that's yeah, a really sorry. good question. No, no, that's, that's totally okay. relevant. Do you mind if I give you like a little bit of the history of life on our planet, Oliver, at least from like a scientist's evolutionary perspective? Just to Not help at talk all. about I would love the that. I'm literally taking notes okay. right now, so that would be great. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Sick. So, do you know about the three domains of life? Have you heard of that before? So there's there's not. what are called back. Okay, so there's bacteria, which are tiny little things. We're full of bacteria. They're all over our skin all the time. Usually, when something goes bad in your fridge, it's bacteria. Uh, there's archaea, which are similar to bacteria, marginally a little bit different. They tend to be in extreme places like, you know, high temperature pools, high salt environments, but it turns out they're everywhere as well because they're 
just a microbe. And then there's um, eukarya, which is all complex multicellular life. So if re we rewind, Earth is something like 3.5 billion years old, according to our records and stuff like that. And Forrest can correct me if I'm wrong on the date there. Um, there's an idea that life in general arose about 2.2 billion years ago, maybe a little bit earlier. Uh, but there was a thing called the last common universal ancestor or last universal common ancestor. It's a Luca, it's mm -hmm. L-U-C-A, the Luca. Yep. And at that point is where these different domains of life started splitting out. So bacteria went first, then archaea, uh, somewhere around 22, uh, 2.2 billion years ago, a bacteria and archaea got together and formed eukarya. So that was the advent of like more complex life. About 1.7 billion years ago, plants split off. And then about 1.2 to 1 billion years ago, fungi and animals split off. So of the things that we tend to care about the most, plants, animals, and fungi, those all diverged, you know, over a billion years ago. Since then, there's been a lot of parallel evolution where all of those things are interacting with one another. And so they're all influencing how the other ones are evolving. Uh, in terms of the fidelity and the flow of information, we're able to look at what's called the genome or the entirety of the DNA in an organism and then look for regions that are um, conserved across many different organisms, which means that this is serves a core purpose to life. So it's the things that help us make energy, excrete waste, this kind of stuff tends to be conserved across many different forms of life. And we can compare all of those similar sequences. And what scientists are able to do then is almost create what's called like a genetic clock. So they can rewind backwards from looking at the conserved changes in our DNA to make a guess about what ancient organisms would have looked like. Um, and so as we look at the history of life, we can start to say, wow, there's some like families of genes that encode for stuff that is in every form of life. And that's part of why when people talk about, well, so much stuff has like, you know, we have, I don't know, 80% of our DNA in common with a banana. Like, well, yeah, because like, there's some things about being alive that you need these things to be there to be alive, right? Um, so that's, that's a little bit of the history of, of, of life on this planet, I guess, and some of the idea that there's these different domains of life, which we all exist within. Does that help contextualize a little bit what we're talking about? Yeah, that does help. Oops, sick. I might have been slightly um, off my, my dates there, but it's easy to just look it up, you know. It's <laughs> good enough. It's good enough. Um, and so, like, the, the, you know, your question when you're talking about losing information in DNA, I think you hit the nail on the head there, is that, like, it depends on what you mean by losing. Because if you're saying, you know, it take, you know, whatever random species, if TikTok, you know, it, it evolved, or, or say the, the reptiles that evolved into birds, yeah, they lost the information on how to be a reptile by changing it into the information on how to be a bird. Um, and so like, you can think of a genetic sequence like a sentence, right? One minor change to the sentence can change the meaning and function of that sentence. It one single comma changes the phrase, let's eat grandma to let's eat grandma. And that's a very different sentence that means something very different. And so you can say you've lost that information, but really it's just, you've taken what's there and you've altered it, you've modified it. Um, and so the thing that I always try to remind people is that evolution is not an inventor. It's a tinkerer. It takes what's there and it stretches it and tweaks it. Um, a great example of that is homologous structures, which I'm making a video about right now, actually. It should be out later on this month. Um, if you homologous look Homologous structures? Homo yeah, exactly. I texted you like, oh my God. Yeah, I'm working on <laughs> homologous structures and I've got these creationists. They're calling them homological structures, which I've never heard in my life. And it technically yeah. is an accurate synonym, but... No, I've ne never, never heard anybody say no, it. No but a great example. Yeah. Nobody. Um, a great example of this is the bones in your arm, right? You have one bone here called a humerus. You've got two bones here called radius and ulna. You got a bunch of little bones right here called carpals, and you've got a bunch of long bones go out here called metacarpals. And that one bone, two bones, little bones, long bones configuration can be seen across all tetrapods as long as they have the fingers to show. 
Um, you look at a bird, you look at a bat, you look at a whale, you look at a frog, you look at a human, they're all going to have the exact same bone structure, just those bones are slightly twisted around. You have seven vertebrae in your neck, seven cervical vertebrae here. So does a fucking giraffe. A giraffe has seven bones in its neck, they're just really big. Um, and so, like, there, there's only two types of mammals that don't have that configuration, and they paid a heavy cost for it. Um, so, like, that's when we talk about losing information in DNA, it's a common creationist talking point to say that the DNA is becoming somehow worthless, that like you've lost the function of the DNA, that the, 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 you know, you, you change one part of a gene. It's not a functional protein anymore. You know, the protein produced isn't functional. Every fucking protein is a functional protein. If it's a protein, it does a thing. It's, it's, it has, you know, it just does it work in the specific way that it's working in your body right at that particular moment. The same protein, the keratin that makes up your hair and fingernails, makes your skin waterproof, also makes feathers. And it also makes scales. So it's a functional protein that's in these different configurations. If you changed it, it would do a different thing. It would still be a protein that did a thing. It just wouldn't be useful for that. What are you saying, Gordon? Can I, can I say something? So um, our genome is all of our DNA. Humans yeah, yeah. have 16 different chromosomes, and we double that because there's a copies from our mother and our father. Um, is that right? 16? Am I crazy? 16. Or am I thinking of these? Sets? It's 23. Yeah. Well, like, yeah. What are you talking about? Anyway, I, I, was, I was reading the comments. I'm sorry. I, somebody was asking what two <laughs> animals. Are there. Somebody was asking what two animals anyway, don't have different numbers of certified. I'm not going to fucking tell you either. Go on. <laughs> what, what I want to get at, um, sorry, is that we have. DNA that gets expressed to make our proteins, but there's a large part of our genome that never gets expressed. It's compacted. And that's what's called the epigenome. So in our lives, we can open up different parts of our DNA to express different parts of that genome. And that's how we have different tissues, right? Our brain cells are different from our skin cells are different from, you know, all the other cells in our body, because within each cell, that DNA is cracked open and used a little bit differently depending on the epigenome, the epigenetics and expression. Um, in terms of losing DNA, I'm going to get go way back down to like bacteria, the simplest form of life, essentially. Um, humans take, what, nine months to gestate and create an offspring. Bacteria can lucky. divide in about 20, 20 minutes, right? So bacteria mm. have a much faster generation time. And that's because instead of having many different chromosomes, they have one and it's a circle. And so all they got to do is like split the DNA and then copy around a circle. And they can even have multiple things doing it at the same time. So they can create multiple, you know, chromosomes and then they divide and new, mm -hmm. each new bacteria gets a, gets another chromosome. Um, bacteria keep their genome small so that they can grow fast. It's an evolutionary advantage, but they will frequently try out other pieces of DNA to help them adapt to diff different situations. So they have, um, think of it like a, like a trading card and their, your genome is like your deck and you're bartering with someone else to like get a card that you think is going to make your deck stronger against opponents, right? Every time you play around, you, your cards are going to come up in different uh, orders and you're, you're going to have to play your deck differently depending on the situation that's in front of you. You can't always play the deck the same way against you know the same opponent you need to be variable so mm -hmm. they use uh things called uh plasmid which is another extremely smaller tiny circle of dna but basically one big circle and then lots of little circles like extra cards that you're adding to your deck and those cards aren't permanently in your deck because they haven't joined the big circular genome but there's a little version of that and that's how bacteria trade like resistances to uh antibacterial drugs and they're able to adapt and quickly trade with each other these little pieces of DNA that give them more functionality in a particular situation. And if, and if it's no longer advantageous for them to have that, it just costs them extra to have to reproduce that thing every time, they get rid of it. They just slough yeah. it off. And that's, that's evolution. Yeah, just any change. It can be a loss of information. It can be changing information. It can be a gain of information. You get a duplication event where DNA is you know, copied extra times. It can be all sorts of, there's lots and lots of different ways to do it. By the way, calm down in the chat. It's sloths and manatees. But uh, yeah, anyway, uh, those, those, that's everything. Um, does that answer your question there? And probably about 15 other questions you had, uh, Oliver? Yeah, actually, that was, no, this is great. I'm, this is helpful so much. Um, it does tie into my next question, though, about the mm -hmm. genetic variation between, I guess, I'm probably going to use the wrong word here because I don't know the whole chart. 
the phylum kingdom species that thing um yeah. what's how do you know like how does that play into the genetic variation between like species like how did how long did it take first i guess no that's not what i want to know um like how do we how are the genetic variations expressed like on a very small scale between things of the same species and then things of a different species and i guess what are some of the factors that cause them to evolve to be something different um so first of all when you're talking about the uh, kingdom phylum class order and all that that's called taxonomy and so if you want to say any one particular group of that no matter how big or how small you can just use the word taxon um, or taxa is also taxa is plural but it can be used singularly it's, it's kind of like the word data it's plural but it can be singular so if you say you know across these three taxa there could be kingdoms could be classes could be species whatever gordon i saw you had something i'm gonna grab this whiteboard over here because i'm about to start drawing doodles oh, sure. here. <laughs> uh, re really quickly um when you talk about things that are very closely related but different like mm -hmm. horse and i are clearly not the same person uh but our DNA, I bet you if I sequenced our DNA, we would be 99.99999% similar. You know, we're both probably of like Northern European heritage. And for the most part, we have similar stuff, but we look different. And part right. of that is because we have different alleles. We have different versions of our genes, but we also probably have a different epigenome. So that's what I was talking about in terms of like the way that genes are expressed and compacted or made accessible. You can have things that are closely okay. related. Uh, but appearing differently because there's, it's not just DNA, it's also how that DNA is compressed and modified by all of the proteins that they're wound up in. So if you're curious about it, you can read more about the epigenome, E-P-I genome. And that's also, if you look at the history of science, there was a big question back in the 50s, is our genetic information inherited as protein or as DNA? And ultimately it's inherited as DNA is what was mm -hmm. decided except for now that we've learned more and more and more, well, it turns out that the heritability of some of those protein states and the proteins that are compacting and affecting our DNA, or even modifications that are made to those proteins, they're called histones, they're big sort of protein wheels that DNA gets wound around and they have little tails. Um, that has a big part of how we adapt to traits within our lives. So there are epigenetic mm -hmm. modifications that are made. If your parents were smokers and obese you're more likely to be a smoker and obese because of those epigenetic modifications and so there is something yep. real to that like sins of the father idea um, we gain <laughs> real genetic markers in our genome based on the experiences we have in our lives yeah this this so there's a uh, also a phrase if you want to get real into this like what what gordon talking about here is like it's another dimension to evolution it's really fucking cool um neo-darwinian evolution is the term for when we apply our understanding of basic genetics with our understanding of basic natural selection. Um, what he's talking about here about this epigenetic traits being passed on, it's not really a genetic change, it's a change in the way the DNA is expressed, That and that's heritable. These are what we call neo-Lamarckian uh, uh, evolution. So Lamarck was the guy who erroneously thought that any change that happens to an animal in its life will be passed on. So if you cut off a ta the tail of a rat, its babies won't have tails too. It turns out he was actually kind of on to something because you could be uh, suffer starvation during pregnancy and your child has a higher rate of obesity and th you know, th these things that kind of actually do matter that aren't technically genetic quote quote traits. Yeah, really, really cool stuff. If you're into that. Um, <clears throat> I want to show you some drawings really quick. Do you have any questions about what Gordon just said first? Uh, yes, but I also took notes over the things you recommended I read into, so I will be looking into those more. Okay. I don't want to take too much time so you guys oh. can get on with other stuff, too. So it's cool. really yeah, yeah, on There's, there's w w one more thing with the idea of speciation is that things mm -hmm. can start you know, moving apart, and often that is based on mutations or its selections towards different things. So say you have like a brother and a sister, um, and they get separated into like two separate populations because of like a mountain range or something like that over a period of time, they will each adapt to their particular environment. And if maybe there's a hole in that mountain range and a thousand or you know a million years later, they're able to meet back up again, those two things will look different and they may not be able to compatibly mate. They might also be able to mate and form hybrids. And there's a big confusing question in science and especially within fungi about like, if two things can still hybridize and produce viable offspring, are they the same species if they look and act different and have completely different associations and that's mm -hmm. 
philosophical question, but yeah, that's that, a little bit of how speciation happens over a long period of time. Yeah, that's that's a big thing. Is when we talk about <clears throat> species, there's um species isn't a real thing. It's 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 a box that we draw around groups, and so there's a lot of different what we call species concepts. There is no definition of species. There is no law of species. There is no theory of species. There's the biological species concept, which is the most common. And that's what Gordon was just saying is that if these two things can interbreed to produce fertile offspring, we'll call them the same species. There's a lot of situations where that doesn't really super work. And there's a lot of different situations where you can't use that. How are you going to tell me whether or not these two dinosaurs could breed? You know what I mean? Like, what are you going to do? So we have a different species uh, concept for fossils. And we have a phylogenetic species concept. And we have an ecological species concept. And we have my favorite is the Hynesian species concept is that if these two uh, lineages have separated and their common ancestor dies, then we call them different species. And that also doesn't work all the time. And so... There's a lot of different ways we try to define a species. Not a single one of them more always works. Um, and, what and I like, like try to are, are, yeah, are Neanderthals a different species, or do we just fuck right. them into oblivion? It, it, it both actually. It turns out it seems, and like that, <laughs> especially especially in bioanthropology, which is the study of the biology and evolution of humans. Um, especially there, we have a really hard time telling what species is what because we just have so many fossils we have so many fossils of human evolution and there are a lot of bioanthropologists out there that argue that like the species homo habilis doesn't exist it's actually all australopithecus something or it's actually homo erectus or actually it's homo you know, rudolfensis should actually be roped in but it's actually diff like we don't argue that human evolution happened we know for sure it happened how and why and in what order and who goes where in what group that's where the arguments lie um and that brings me to this let me show you something really quickly okay i've got here a, a whiteboard and i've drawn a graph here and so here i've got on the y-axis is frequency and here on the x-axis is variation okay so let's take a trait right and cause some variation let's say we have um tail length in a group of squirrels. So we have some arboreal rodents that are crawling up around the treetops and they have differently linked tails. And so we can draw, if you're familiar with a bell curve, a standard distribution like this, right? And so here, that's a, whoa, that's a lot of kurtosis going on here. That's real skewed. Um, but uh, here we've got the, the middle ground right here, right? Here's the median, okay? And so these are the most average length tails. These guys over here have super, super small tails. These guys over here have super, super big tails, right? And so in a population, you expect to have this variation. And most common is going to be just kind of the middle. And a few rarities are going to have super long or super short tails. Okay. So you, does this graph make sense here what I'm showing you? Do you understand what I'm drawing? Uh, yeah. I'm watching the video and it's a little bit behind, but I'm familiar with the concept so I can visualize cool. where this is going. Sick. Okay, great. So let's say, for example, that having a longer tail allows them to pump blood into that tail and make it look like the animal's bigger than it is, and that scares away snakes. That's actually something that squirrels do. They can pump blood in their tail, and animals that can see heat like snakes and stuff think that they're too big to catch, and that's useful. So now these guys now are going to have more children. We've created selection pressure. That means that selection pressure is the evolutionary way of saying, if you do this, you die. If you don't do that, you die. So here's these guys now are better at surviving. So over two for generations, the ones with the shortest tails aren't going to live very long. The ones with medium tails are going to do okay, but not great. The ones with the longest tails really do well. And so we have what we call directional selection, where this graph is just going to slide to the right. And over a few generations now, these guys are going to become the norm. And these guys back here die off. And this the population shifts and kind of moves. That's directional selection. That's one way that we can lead to speciation. Eventually, you're going to have a new species form. We're not going to be able to call these the same kind of squirrels anymore because they get different so much. Um, another imagine thing that another population of squirrels on the other side of the mountain being selected for in the opposite direction. You know, I'm over getting there, and now we there, add. There, you know, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Trying to skip a chunk. As, so now we get to a point where we have this population, and this uh, we now get to a point where having a bigger tail is actually deleterious. It's not advantageous anymore because there it's too much tail, and it's getting tangled in branches, and it's too, it takes too much energy to grow it, and so now they don't want to go back but they don't want to go forward anymore. And so you get what's called stabilizing selection, 
where this part of the graph just gets so much higher and the tails die off. And so the, the graph gets skinnier and taller right here in the middle where this becomes more and more frequent. That's called stabilizing selection. What Gordon was talking about, rudely. <laughs> um, no, no, you're fine because I did the same thing. Um, I, love that you, I love that you knew where well, I was going. Well, you're, you're, while you're drawing, let me just say one thing too, is these traits yeah. are alleles, so right? They're versions of genes. So these things may evolve almost separately from the organism itself because a gene can evolve as it's a function of an organism, but it's all about the number of that allele within a population. So yes, it's the organism, right. but it's also specifically that chunk of DNA that is being passed on because of this trait that it's conferring. Right, right, for sure. Um, that's what's always important to remember is that it's phenotype that's selected for, not genotype. So those alleles are going to change in the population and they get weeded out through genetic drift, whether or not they're actually expressed. It's a whole other thing. Um, so last thing is what Gord was talking about is what we call disruptive selection. So let's say we have the, there's, the, there's, you know, there's this, uh, uh, uh heterogenetic, uh, environment that these guys are living in and way up Pro high in the trees shows up and decides to harvest all the long yeah <laughs> exactly you know, yeah so Make some of the long-tailed squirrels are doing really well avoiding that predator the short-tailed squirrels are doing better with another predator there's actually selection pressure for both and the ones in the middle with the average length, those are the ones that kind of just are there. You know what I mean? These guys, too, on either side of the graph have a high uh, 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 fecundity now because of this. And so what you end up with is a graph that looks like this with two lobes going on like that. This is called disruptive selection, where you're going to have both ends getting higher, the middle going here. And this is a highway to speciation right here. We have one species forming into two. Um, that's a way that can happen. So like these are different, what we call pathways, different, different mechanisms of selection that you can have that causes speciation in different ways at different rates for different reasons. And it's important to remember when you're looking at this, that these are patterns of selection that we can observe in nature. But at the end of the day, a species is still whatever the fuck we say it is. These are just methods of, of that evolution takes um, when you're talking about this stuff. That's, that's where species come from. That is the origin of species, is these different mechanisms of selection. What are you talking about, Gordon? Look at you, look at you Darwin, on the origin of species. Um, <laughs> Oliver, I was, I was gonna say, one, one interesting well, thing you could do to look, look at um, human evolution and something that's very tangible, and it's still, when, when creationists talk about evolution isn't happening or whatever, it's like, this is still mm -hmm. happening and constantly, our ability to digest lactose as adults. Yes. If you look at a world map at the, the ability to digest lactose when you're not a baby, it's very heavily shifted to cold environments where there is a strong selective pressure to be able to survive on milk during winter. So Forrest, can you digest milk? I sure can. Or are you lactose intolerant? Yeah, I, I sure I, can I, too. I love milk. And it's, it's, it has a lot to do with what the fact that I'm so pale too, because my ancestors lived in a place where it was snowy and cold and they needed to make a lot of vitamin D because there wasn't enough sunshine mm -hmm. and they needed to drink milk during winter or they would die. So yep. I can drink milk, but like my best friend growing up was from Thailand. His genetic history did not have any of those selective pressures. So he could not drink milk. It made him very gassy and get the squirts. So the ability to express that enzyme has been epigenetically selected for long enough or accrued a mutation that then allowed my ancestors to produce the enzyme to digest lac lactose, you know, the sugar, um, lactase, I think is the enzyme. And so I make mm -hmm. that as an adult. If I stop drinking milk entirely, if I went vegan for a while, I've heard of a lot of people who lose the ability to make that enzyme. So it's not something that's always there. You have to maintain some level of like, hey, here's this pressure, my body's going to keep making it. But if you look at yeah. a worldwide map of different genetic lineages, it's really mixed. There's places in like the Middle East where every, it's about 50-50. You know, people yeah. are lactose intolerant or tolerant. And there's certain places like Southeast Asia where it's like 0.02% of the adult population can digest lactose and everyone else cannot. And I feel bad mm -hmm. because I love cheese. Um, and I, <laughs> I want them to enjoy cheese. And and sometimes and, I've had friends who are like, "Screw it, I'm gonna I'm gonna pop one of those little pills and like eat the eat the cheese yeah. anyhow." Um, and let me tell you, Oliver, bro, we could. Oh my God, what Gordon was just talking about with like having to continue doing the thing and like that's a whole shit on cell signaling and on confirmation changes within cell receptors and like having like positive versus negative reception. It's, 
that is a 30 minute discussion in and of itself that'll blow your fucking face apart. It's so cool. Yeah. Anyway, uh, even that, al- that, hysteric that, interactions and lack. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, girl. The, the, oh, the, my the, God. Lack, you want to get into the lack operon and gene expression? Oh, my God. <laughs> Fucking shit, dude. Um, do you have another question, or is, or is that that about it for today? Um, I have a couple, but some of them should be really short and easy. Um, okay, we've got we've been on thirty five. It's been really... us talking, so let's let's breeze through them. <laughs> okay, uh, the first one. I'm gonna sound really dumb for this, but what is Homo habilis or Hobilis? You mentioned it, but I have no clue what that is. Yeah. Homo habilis, and you don't ever worry about uh, the. You ask questions. That's how you learn shit. Nobody sounds dumb. It's fine. Um, the Homo habilis is one of our ancestors, um, and so uh, we, Homo we habilis are erectus. <laughs> yeah, was, we are not yeah. erectus. We are erect though. Um, but uh, the so the the lineage of of humanity um, uh, goes back uh, for a long time. Um, our genus. Homo, which genus is one level of classification above species, are the genus Homo starts around 2.6 million years ago with Homo habilis, and the term Homo habilis it, it means handy person or like ca- capable uh, a person, um, and it's because that's where they start making the stone tools that we associate with with humans. Um, there's a lot of there is actually some good evidence showing that it goes back further than that, and there's a whole again it's part of the reason why this is so debated, but Homo, H-O-M-O, habilis, H-A-B-I-L-I-S, um, is the first uh, a member of the genus Homo. Um, and then directly after those guys, uh, if you're really, really narrowing this down, uh, a, a big one is Homo erectus, um, erectus, E-R-E-C-T-U-S, um, which means upright walking person is what it means. Um because they thought that's where we started walking upright. We had been doing it for millions of years since that, before then. What are you saying? Uh, so the Homo habilis, I was talking earlier about like the last common ancestor. So Homo yeah. habilis would be the last common ancestor for all Homo thing. It's like, you know, imagine a yeah. single point and then it radiates outwards based on all this factors we were talking about with speciation. Yes. And there's, there, and this is what I was talking about earlier is that there's a lot of debate over where exactly to put them. And, and whether or not they are the actual beginning or whether or not there's something a little bit different or, you know what I mean? And so like, that's, that's the whole thing. That's where, um, you know, where this gets really interesting for, for us. And so I'll show you something and there's a million other species. There's Homo, Homo rudolfensis was around the same time. And we argue whether or not it was real or whether it was actually Homo habilis that just looked weird or whatever. Um, there was, a uh, 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 oh God, what else? Um, Homo habilis and Homo erectus overlap quite a bit. So, have you seen that diagram? It's 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 called the March of Progress. It was made by a guy named, named Rudolf Zallinger, where it's like a monkey that like slowly levels up into a human. Have you seen that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that that's a pile of shit. It's it, it's like saying that the Civil War was a disagreement. It's it's just grossly oversimplified view of evolution. The reality is that evolution isn't a straight line like that. It's a tangled bush. And so you have species that break off and sometimes they get back together and sometimes they exist contemporaneously for a little while. And then one of them dies off later. And by that time, this one's already given off five other branches. And like we just explained with species, where you draw the lines between groups is really fucking fuzzy. Um, And so let me go ahead and pull this up here. Um, Blop, doop. This is, if you want to, you can look this up. Let me see if I can get this on the screen. No. I'm also going to make the point quickly that if, if human ancestors were anything like humans, um, we probably slept with everything that had two legs. So yep. whatever could hybridize, hybridized. And you look at, see that mm-hmm. in our genomes now, when you see the amount of like Neanderthal DNA, and we have like the amount of Denovian DNA we have. Um, we got really important features. Like a lot of our immune system comes from Neanderthals. So Jesus of Christ land with this thing, dude, I'm trying to get this in the middle of the page. It's going poorly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And th- there is a substantial amount of evidence that, that we, we interbred with Neanderthals all the time. And, and Gordon, 
said something earlier on that may have sounded like a joke about like screwing them into non-existence. No, the, it, it, there's massive amounts of evidence now showing that we interbred with them every single time we ever came across them. And right. we, they didn't go extinct because they were outcompeted or whatever. We absorbed them into our species. And that's why a lot of people, especially of European descent have Neanderthal DNA today. Um, we, so we this like is a blurred. really great you will be assimilated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a really great website it's the smithsonian's website uh humanorigins.si.edu and i'll post this in the chat um but this has a list you can see this is alphabetical you can go by age here these are human ancestors going all the way back to Sechalanthropus and Ororin. Here's Australopithecus afarensis here Artipithecus over there uh Kenyanthropus fuck you Kenyanthropus um here's a, a Homo <laughs> habilis starting in here um this is uh, the Paranthropines. They split off. So we had the Australopiths, the Australopithecines uh, earlier on. Um, and then they split into Homo and Paranthropus being the two groups. Paranthropus is actually a reclassification of what used to be called Australopithecus. We found out they were just super different. Um, and then here's Homo habilis. Here's Homo erectus, Homo rudolfensis. Here's Floresiensis. And down here, you can see this graph. And you notice, I don't know, you said you were seeing the screen here. This guy here is a better explanation of our understanding of, of human origins. This isn't a direct branch. We're not drawing connections between this. All this shows is where these species came into the fossil record and when they go out. And the fuzzier the end, like you see here, Homo floresiensis, really, really fuzzy end here because it's kind of contentious as to how long they existed it, it, on the early side. On the later side, we're, we're pretty sure. Um, what is this? Oh, God. Hold on. Let me move this. Uh, I just got a notification. Okay. I got it. Um, so, so first, okay. but what, about the missing, Sorry, what about the missing link, man? Where's the missing link? Right. You can, and I just realized I left my screen capture on, so everybody saw there's there's on Discord with Jimmy Snow telling me, hey, you've been talking about evolution for a long time. Make sure to promote Super <laughs> Chats and move on to the next call. <laughs> um, anyway, but yeah, this this is a great resource oh, for Jimmy anybody who wants it. <laughs> As if he doesn't expect this from me. Um, but yeah, everybody can go to that, and I'll make sure to put that in the thing. Oh, God, that's the wrong display capture. Oh God, where am I? <laughs> there it is. The face there it is. <laughs> guys, guys, this is my real job. We're God, professionals. So yes. Um, but yeah, that's he that's does all this to make a and living. We, um, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I don't make a living. So I do this professionally, I just don't make a living. Oh man. But yeah, uh, Anyway, hey, those are all that. And uh, <laughs> the last the last comments from Jimmy on that were, are you monitoring this forest in all caps? No, no, I wasn't. <laughs> Clearly, I wasn't. Um, but yeah, that's that's all. I hope that that makes sense to you, Oliver. I hope those answers your questions. <laughs> okay. Um, it doesn't, but you gave me a site that I will look into and I will read until it does. Um, Okay. I just have one more question, and then I promise I'm done. Okay, we'll, we're very briefly, and then we'll jump into the next one. It, yeah, it should be really easy. I'm just curious because you were talking about um, people who are able to digest lactose and people who aren't, um, and I was yeah. curious about what the difference between an adaption and an evolution is between people, because I know a lot of people around me would call that an adaption to the environment and not an evolu mm -hmm. like not evolution. So I'm curious how, yeah. like, what the difference is. Um, so How long adaptation, it yeah, it, it, it's really, so uh, the, the definition of evolution is any change in the heritable characteristics of a population over the course of multiple generations. That's what evolution is. Um, the term adaptation is really fuzzy because it can be used to describe a trait. It can be used to describe the, the, uh, the, the development of a trait. It can be used to describe the process of evolution. It can be used for all these things. So really just the long and short of it is if you have any trait um that that say say lactose tolerance say the length of your arms say your color of your hair whatever else it is any trait at all that's passed on from parent to offspring as it starts to develop in the population because any trait can be passed on once but as the population starts to shift 
towards or away from that trait over the course of multiple generations, that is evolution. The process of that happening and the trait itself can be called an adaptation. Um, but it, it is evolution. And people who try to split hairs between adaptation and evolution do not know the difference between them and, 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 and how evolution actually works. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much for being here. Seriously, we really appreciate the time and, and listening to us ramble for so long. We know we just gave you a semester's worth of freaking <laughs> talking all in like a 30-minute call. Uh, but I hope it was helpful to you. It was super helpful. Ironically, I actually decided that I was going to walk myself out of theism and into atheism by writing a paper on the potential or the likelihood that God is real. So this has given me so much material to just go crazy with. Um, let's hope I can process it in three weeks and get that paper in. Uh, I really Definitely, appreciate yeah. this. This has been super, super helpful. And please, hey, call back in next time either Gordon or I are on and, and ask more questions. I'm always happy to answer them, seriously. Will do. Thank you guys so much. See you later, Oliver. Have a good day. Thanks. I'm pretty sure they've called in support before and they're always super nice. Um, I'm also going to drop this link in the chat there if anybody wants to learn some more stuff about evolution. I've got this really cool uh, series on my channel called <clears throat> The Light of Evolution. It's a four-part series that anybody can watch in simple, basic layman's terms that anybody can learn about how these things happen. And I might be working on some more episodes coming up next year. Who knows? Um, you and I should do a deep dive into fungal evolution because that's wild. Girl. Girl. Don't get me started. <laughs> um, Girl. But yeah, that's... Uh, with that, uh, as you saw in the chat with Jimmy screaming at me, uh, Super Chats are still a thing. Uh, if you want to send in anything, uh, $5 or more, Gordon and I are answering them. Uh, and then, uh, but that comes up at the end of the show, and we've got one more uh, call to take, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be not super brief with this one, but we'll see what, like, what we need. We've got uh, Daniel calling in from Toronto, pronouns he, him, uh, believes that there is alien activity that explains UFO phenomena, uh, Daniel, tell us about them aliens. Yeah, hi there. Um, well, it's just something I've been uh, following for what, what the last 40 years, the UFO phenomenon, and um, I I'm thoroughly convinced that there's a real alien uh, reality behind the phenomena. Why? Well, because uh, there, there's been uh, different aspects to it. Um, the UFO sightings have been going on for a long time now, for the past uh, 75 years, starting with the uh, Foo Fighters, you know, World War II. Uh, I, know what, sure. I know what the U stands for. That was going to be my question. <laughs> it's like how it, 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 you know, a little while ago, we, we talked to a caller. Um, it was right at the beginning of the show, and we talked about ghosts. And they said, that there was this crazy unexplained phenomenon that happened to them. They, they were in the kitchen and the cabinets were slamming and all this. And, they don't, and they've said, I don't know what happened. Therefore, I know what happened. It was ghosts. And I'm wondering, you know, what's, what's the difference between what they said and what you're saying now? I don't know what something is in the sky. Therefore, it's aliens. How are you getting there? Um, well, the first difference is that I don't believe it's anything to do with supernatural. I believe they're actual... They, they could be actual sure. craft. I really, the, majority, the majority of UFO reports have prosaic, down-to-earth explanations. It's a tiny percentage, and those tiny percentages are very interesting, and they can't be explained. I mean, they haven't been explained properly. And, some, right. and, I, I, and I'm firmly convinced that they are uh, of alien origin. Um, uh, there's also the abduction phenomenon that's been going on for the last uh, 50 years or so. And it's never been fully uh, satisfactorily answered. Is it a mental phenomenon, um, or is it real? I mean, I mean, like if you look at so the abduction the, phenomenon. The, yeah, well, uh, have we noticed a consistent pattern in those abduction stories where, like, they're all saying the same basic things, or like they all link up, or they all make sense cohesively, or like they have any predictive power at all, and, 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 or are they just people telling stories? Um, what I'm trying to say is that you got three choices. What's happening, right? Either they're lying, or they're, you know, they're they're making it up for some reason, or they're having a mental issue where it's, they really believe it's happening, but it's mental phenomena of the brain, or or it's really happening. And so I think with those three choices, 
um, I'm becoming more and more convinced that it's really happening to people. And one change, one change that's been happening over the decades is that more and more people realize that it's been a lifelong uh, thing happening to them, like almost like they're being tracked, like like an animal. Right. Like we, we've tracked- and that and that makes you very interesting at parties. And I'm sure that has nothing <laughs> to do with why they would be saying it. Like that's, you, you, do you? What about Bigfoot? Do you believe in in Bigfoot sightings and Loch Ness monster sightings? Well, not not necessarily. I mean, they could be they could be some re- remaining creature from past times or something. Um, I don't know. Um, so, so here's the really thing: why why is it with that? Because they're the exact same options. Either people are lying, or there's something that's really there, or they had a psychotic episode and thought they saw something when they didn't. Why in these right. scenarios, when we're talking about Bigfoot and the Loch Ness monster and Mothman and Goatman and all these other things, are you willing to say? Yeah, there's probably they're either crazy or they're lying or they made something up or they had a dream and they misinterpreted it or any of the reasons that we would give the theistic claims as well. Either they're lying or they are under a misapprehension. But in this one, you're going to say the exact same background, the exact same uh, possibilities, the exact same, uh, uh, I should say, like standard of evidence is good enough for you. But I don't I don't think it's exact same standard of evidence. This has nothing to do with the supernatural. It's either really happening. I'm not saying or neither. Not. Neither is Bigfoot. Bigfoot isn't supernatural. He's a real guy, no, and lots of people will say to see him. Can I jump? So why don't you can I jump him? in for one sec? Yeah, j- jump in, Gordon. Okay, so Daniel, um, I'm going to go ahead and agree yep. with you that I think there's life on other planets. Hundred percent. Sure. Given the size of the universe, given the we are one galaxy of literally millions if not more it's hard to actually comprehend how large our universe is there's definitely some form of life elsewhere in the universe in all likelihood that life is microbial and fairly small the chance of there being other intelligent sentient cognizant life that is capable of movement through the stars is small it's not infinitesimally small but it is small and it is the sort of, you know, fodder for sci-fi. Uh, that being said, like Forrest was talking about, there hasn't really been enough credible evidence that I've seen. And granted, some of this is behind the veil of governments. It's behind the secrecy of military operations, a lot of other things. It seems to me like a lot of the things we've seen and heard over the years in terms of UFO things and unknown objects have probably been stuff like weather balloons, early drone technology, and especially in the era of drones, I basically don't trust anything, you know, unknown flying object. It's it's a drone. It's going to be a drone. It's probably was a drone 30 years ago, if not longer. Uh, So that any form of some, somebody seeing something in the air flying around and not knowing what it is, I, I kind of initially just reject that. In terms of the abduction experiences, like Forrest was saying, there's a phenomenological thing that happens where people have heard of this. They see the press, the attention, the other types of accolades and rewards that go along with telling this kind of story. And it creates a pattern in society of people doing this. And if you tend to look at the people who make these kinds of claims, it's not uncommon for them to be grifters or pathological liars in other aspects of mm-hmm. their life. But because they start talking about alien abduction, they gain credibility with a certain group of people and then that fuels their storytelling and perpetuates that. I'm not saying completely that I don't believe that we haven't been visited by aliens. I don't have, but I don't have any good proof for it. I do have a fair amount of evidence and proof that points to most of these stories being made up. So I guess I'm sitting on the side of still being skeptical because I haven't seen anything that convinces me yet. And I think Forrest is making the point to you that you've decided to sit on the side of like, well, I think this is happening because of what you've seen, but we're on different sides of that, like, proof and evidence divide right you, you wouldn't do the same thing for anything else so i don't understand why you do it here yeah that's kind of where i'm at yeah but but there's one big difference is that there's a real reason if, if, if the government is keeping a secret and the aliens themselves don't want to reveal themselves then how is anyone going to find any evidence for it or discover it i mean if. um what, what, what is, the, is the biggest what is word it? that you just said there yeah i agree but there's a the lot of assumptions time. being made. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, if, yeah, I, I, if there are gnomes living in my attic, then their nervous systems might be made of cotton candy. 
that that's not a, now a thing for me to investigate the plausibility of cotton candy nervousness. You know what I mean? Like that's what, what are we doing? Also, we have had satellite technology in the air for, well, I don't know, 50, 60 years longer. There's a lot of shit in our atmosphere. Uh, and there's a lot of sensing technology yeah. around our planet constantly. And we've been monitoring constantly for, I don't know, 70 years. We still haven't heard anything. No responses, no yeah. nothing. But, so these aliens but, must but really want... not want to be found. Yeah, maybe they don't. Maybe it's like the prime directive like in, in Star Trek, where they, they know that they will affect society or they'll affect our civilization, and they have to keep themselves secret. And maybe the government knows that too. Or maybe that's My... going to affect them. I don't know. There could be... But you I know, feel like we're on a clue. repeat with the same call that we had earlier with the guy who decided he wanted to believe in God, even though he knew there was no good reason for it. Like you, you no, keep saying that's supernatural. maybe you keep saying, no, it, it doesn't matter whether it's supernatural or not. You keep saying it maybe it's this way. You keep saying maybe it's this way. And if it's this way, then maybe it's that way. And if that's real, then maybe it's this. And you know, maybe there's a reason we don't have any evidence for it. And you're doing all this thing to just excuse the fact that you don't have any evidence for it. So why would you believe something evidence. without evidence? Well, I think I do have evidence. One is you have evidence the, uh, of anomalies that are aliens. Being... Well, yeah. In our, in a, you see, the big mistake everyone makes is that they think aliens have to come from outside of our solar system. What if they're already in our solar system? Because there seems to what, be lots. What of evidence do you have of anomalies. aliens? There, in the in the two thousands, a lot of the channels started coming on YouTube, anomaly channels, where they looked at NASA, where they look at NASA and uh, JPL and all the other space agencies, the photos of planets, the moon, Mars, and you can see all sorts of anomalies that they that they seem that they cover up, they 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 blur the picture, they don't want people to see it. But but with Photoshop, maybe the picture can, was just uh, blurry to begin can, with. But maybe they're obfuscating the the picture. Maybe well. well but Do you is, have any reason to believe that they are? Do you have any evidence well, that they are he, deliberately he obfuscating the picture? Yeah, yeah. You could see. Well, one was the billion pixel uh, picture uh, from uh, Mars that um, NASA had on its website, and you could move around. You know, you could. It was this location. I think it was called Rock's Nest. And it's this location on Mars, and you can move around the uh, picture. You know what I mean? To various areas. It was uh, it was an interactive uh, site. Uh, they still have it, but and you can see all sorts of things that look like uh, animals, that look like little beings, that look like, uh, look rem like. Re remnants of a, a destroyed. What? Remember, remember? Did you ever see the face on Mars? Yes, the face and the face on Mars is a good example. They, 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 and then, they, the picture that came what happened when we got a? What happened when we got a better resolution image of the face on Mars? That that wasn't a better resolution picture. That picture was photoshopped shit out of it. How they, do you that know? Not, that picture is bullshit. Because they did the same How do you thing know? once before when they first came out in seventy six. In seventy six, they oh. came out with the picture, and everyone said, "Hey, there's a face." Then NASA came out and said, "No, we've had another Passover, and there's no face." But they didn't release the picture. And it wasn't until years later, till two uh, scientist guys, they found the, they found the pictures misfiled, and they had the face. So NASA was lying. And and then recently How? in two thousand one, I'm, I'm asking you picture. That picture is bullshit. What because is your you, evidence you that that picture has been changed, or is it just that you because don't trust a NASA? TSA, because there's a European Space Agency picture that came out afterwards, and the face is still there. But it looks a little worn on the left side, of, or the right side. So it's still a different picture. And it, yeah, and it doesn't look the same as the NASA one. You can see they tried from day one to, to downplay that, but that's only the tip of the iceberg. There are anomalies uh, being found by by people all, in all sorts of NASA pictures. Yes, there there are so, lots so Daniel, of different I, things that we. Sorry, you go ahead, Gordon. Well, okay. I, I, I wanna, I'm going to bring this back to the idea of there being like alien life in our system that we are somehow unaware of. Mm. Um, a couple of years ago, there was yeah. a guy who put forth a postulation that there were fungi, uh, puffball-like mushrooms on Mars. And this isn't something that NAPA said, Na NASA reported or talked about, but he looked at photos from Mars and he saw little 
round things. And so he took a graphics program and did a bunch of fancy math on these pictures that NASA had taken and postulated that these white things were mushrooms. None of what he did or said was based in fact. It was an assumption he had, and he used fabricated data to make these images appear as if they were something that they were not. I read this paper and debunked it and reviewed it. NASA has done some testing and shown that they're just mineral deposits. There's absolutely no story here. NASA's not lying, but this guy knew that he would make headlines if he said that mushrooms were on Mars. So he mm -hmm. did it. And I think a lot of what you're getting at as evidence or proof is simply people that were trying to get attention. Like Forrest said, you say this kind of stuff at parties and people will pay attention to you because you're more interesting. It's like the aliens guy. Is he credible yeah. in any way? No, but he flipped his hair up and looked weird. Now he's fucking famous. Mm -hmm. that, that's really the long no, and short these, of it, man. These aren't bad. No, these aren't bad. These are just channels of people that they, they just have average day jobs. And this is like their hobby. They look at these pictures. They always provide, they always provide the original NASA picture. They do the Photoshop right in front of you. They take the picture. They burn away the uh, the the, the uh, obfuscation, the blur that NASA put there, and you see what looks like they doesn't look like na natural. It looks like piping and um, tubes. Daniel, and, earlier uh, you said sorry, even the supernatural. But what you're talking about right now is not just even supernatural. It's literal human fabrication. No, it's not. From a logical standpoint, these are, what, well, these you are have what a you difference can see in, in the NASA photo. But these are what, but these people are using NASA photos. Are you, are not, you talking about photos, photos from like forty years ago? Because we have fresher images that you can look at in much, much no, higher these resolution. Are fresh images. These are, yeah, they're fresh images, and many times they're blurred, and they show them. You can see them. They they they, they always provide the text, the, the picture that the source, the NASA source that they're using, and you can see them. Okay, in the so picture I, that they're a lot of times they're blurry. Sure, I'm going to come back. Do you believe that there's like intelligent life that's visiting our planet from plants within our solar system? Yeah. Is that your belief? Yeah. Okay. Do we have any evidence for it? Do you think that we'd be able to hide like an alien civilization on another planet when we're constantly taking photos with high resolution telescopes? Yeah, if you blur the picture, if you don't show the public the actual picture, sure. Yeah, you can. So you you think that there's a coordinated campaign between like NASA, the government, and home astronomers who have telescopes and can look at anything in high definition uh, to hide you this can't, truth? You can't from see the world. surface. You can't see the surface of a planet well, what, with a telescope. What planet? What planet are they on? Well, like like uh, the moons of of, Mar uh, of um, uh, Jupiter, uh, like uh, Ganymede. If you look at the pictures of Ganymede. They look like they're structures. They look like there are like so, massive structures that are. That are, are you like familiar? Like, yeah, you're talking about tubes and things like Daniel. Are you familiar with yeah. the, uh, the uh, Have you ever heard of Percival Percival Lowell? L O W E L L. Percival Lowell. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, so Percival Lowell was an astronomer. Um, and he was the, he's the founder of the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. It's where they discovered Pluto. I've been there. It's amazing. Um, I loved it. It's phenomenal. It's Pluto. an amazing place. I have a, bring, a video all about Pluto. it on my YouTube channel, <laughs> right? I've got a video all about it on my YouTube okay. channel. It's fantastic. Um, so it, the, the place is fantastic the videos, meh. but like, go check it out. Um, but one thing that I talk about in that video, and one thing that I learned when I was there is that one of the reasons Percival Lowell was interested in astronomy is because of his belief in alien civilizations on other planets, specifically about Mars. He would stare at Mars, and he talked about, he drew whole maps of the canal systems on Mars, these straight canals all over the planet that had hubs and connections, and it was evidence of cities and of connections between those cities, these pipes and tubes and everything that ran between them, and this must be how they're connecting water and everything like that. And then we flew a rover by Mars, and there were no canals. And it turns out what he was seeing was imperfections in his telescopes and the, the cataracts in his own eyes. 
And so when we look out with the technology we have, people don't seem to realize just how big of a distance we're talking about here and the kind of technology when we load up a camera onto a, a, a drone or a, a probe and send it way out into uh, um, the you know these other planets, it's an insane distance. Yeah, and by the time the thing gets there, it's already like it's, the technology's changed so much. So we're taking the best quality images that we can from insane distances out in space with whatever technology we got, and that's bound to change, and the images are bound to change, and what we get, the data we collect back is bound to change. And that's why things are getting better and better and changing more and more as resolution increases. That that's Isn't Forrest, that such can, can an I, easier and one, more... Yeah, go for it. One little factoid here. Um, so yeah, I looked yeah. up Ganymede. Uh, Ganymede's icy surface, uh, there is, there's apparently liquid water there, but Ganymede is much colder than Earth. The daytime surface temperature ranges from negative 297 to negative 171 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and mm -hmm. its moon receives about 1 30th the amount of sunlight that the Earth does. So to right. me, that says it would be very difficult for life to exist. It would have been very difficult right. for life to survive. And if there's any life there, it is 100% absolutely microbial and microscopic. I'm, that, that's usually I'm not, the claim I'm that I hear whenever we're talking about Ganymede or Europa is that it's ice on the surface, right. but because of the tidal forces of the planets that's surrounding, it's got a liquid interior with possibly right. warm water that could be conducive to life. But even then, I mean, that's there's still, a core that's warm. That's, that's yeah, that's like still that. purely theoretical. We have no evidence of that it's a fun story and it's really cool really it several miles true. worth of ice on top yes i'm i love talking about that I'm shit not, but it's not something that we actually have evidence for i'm not i'm not saying that life on ganymede is, uh, is indigenous i believe that these are civilized that they've created their own you, environment within a planet you think there's that yeah, man's space, space, space planet or moon and, pardon okay so you're you talking about panspermia. panspermia. Yeah, that's the, so like, and this no, is another I, thing. No, like I'm I, talking I, about, no, no, I'm talking about a, a, an advanced civilizations that they have to, at one point, we're going to have to leave our planet, right? We have to figure out, uh, 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 or we have to survive if our planet, if our, if our environment changes, we have to move underground. And if we have to leave the planet, then we have to go to another, and if our star collapses or something, if the sun whatever dies or whatever we have to leave this planet and i think i think if you get to a point in a civilization of your technology i think you can develop a technology where you can go to any planet and and live with inside it create your own um right. contained environment i just did you grow up we've got a yeah did you watch the star trek because i love star trek but it's also sci-fi right. i'm aware of that's that's the thing man i we've got to move on to super chats but like i just like i want to get across I get you. that for, the, for this whole call for 20 minutes now what you've been doing consistently you talked about like well there's these these ufo sightings and that means that the alien is, is a suggestion that the aliens must be real and if they're real then the government's hiding them and then we have these pictures and these pictures are different and that could mean that the government's changing the pictures and 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 it did this one looks blurred and there's a youtube video where somebody takes the blurring off how do they take the blurring off did, did they go in there with a, a, a eraser and do it no they they used a computer to try to reverse what could possibly be there the computer makes some guesses yeah. and it came up with something that kind of looks like a stick and that must mean that there's a stick right and like what you keep doing over and over is you are using the claim as evidence you are you are instead of providing evidence for the claim you're just repeating a different claim with the word if in front of it as if that justifies the original belief and it just doesn't when at the end of the day you you've well, drawn a line several times between supernatural and natural it doesn't matter if something's like it, it's still the same it's it's a, a claim that you're making without a good reason to believe it whether it's aliens or bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, or Ted Cruz's integrity, or fun vegans. They're things that we talk about, but they're not fucking real until we have proof of it. We have to see actual proof of it. We can't just say, well, if and if and if. It, it has to be something substantive. 
Well, I think and the we're willing to change our mind if you have substantial control. proof. Right. We're right, willing to change no, our I, mind, I, but you I, haven't I, given us a reason. Well, what, what proof would you want? A fucking alien, alien sitting alien. down <laughs> and saying hello. Right. What? You know, I, Literally, I would pro- fucking love for Star Trek to be true. Can we, ha- can we have the Federation already? Can we get rid of all the stupid infighting and focus our energy outwards? Right. And the continuation of our species and terraforming new planets and exploring the world? Fuck yeah, let's do that. But we're not there yet. Yeah. Right. Well, that's it. Yeah, what, you asked me yet. what what evidence because I want for aliens. What aliens. evidence would you? Well, you're, you're asking me what evidence I want for aliens. What evidence would you want for Bigfoot? You'd want a good, decent picture of one. You'd want actual residue yeah, just, of it. Uh, You'd want a fossil. A, You'd want a bone. DNA sequence. Yeah. A DNA se- some something, an actual sample, not just well, I saw a weird thing in the woods, and if the government's hiding it, then it might be this. That's not good enough for anything else, for you or me. So I don't know why you make it good enough well, for aliens. Uh, uh, abduction victims have had, uh, they found um, like strange metallic objects in their bodies. And, and yes, and you know how those get there? <laughs> so, Do you so know have doctors, they find a lot of stuff yes. on people's butts. Yes, you find like, you step on stuff, stuff gets into your body, and you form a callus around it and it lives there for a long time and then sometimes it breaks loose and you roll it around there have been interviews with doctors about these things and they're just not special i I understand that i understand that and yet in this one particular context you're willing to suspend that understanding and say if 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 then it's aliens and i i don't get it dude Well, again, and there's a good reason why it would have to be covered up if they, uh, if it's true. If, because, uh, you if, look at- if, anyway, that's, that's it, man. We've yeah, got to go. Want- we've been doing for 25 minutes and all you've said is if for 25 yeah, minutes. Yeah. So we've got to move on, man. Oh, Canada. <laughs> yeah, call I back in sometime, man. We'll talk about some more. The- is that what it is? Uh, the fucking Canadians. That's what it is. The, Cana- the goddamn <laughs> aliens are Canadians. That's what it is. a little bit of a crazy Canuck. I mean, I appreciate the energy. I like. I want that to be true. I really do. I'm mean, not the whole government cover up part, but like, if we could get aliens to come, that'd be dope. Couldn't we settle a mm-hmm. lot of the differences on this planet if we had fucking independent? I mean, I don't actually want Independence Day to happen, but like, you know, humanity. You, you, I, I said this once in a TikTok. I was like, can we pretend that climate change is aliens? Because then maybe we can all fucking unite to fight against yeah. it. That'd be rad. I don't know, man. We got some super chats to I get to. So we'll... Aliens. That's, yeah. that's conspiracy theory I can get behind. Except that's pretty tight. Us. Whoops. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Uh, we got some super chats to get to, so we're going to jump into them. Uh, starting out with $10 <laughs> from Connor Arunda. Sorry to waste super chat this early, uh, but are there any plants to ma- uh, any plans to make a podcast out of those i listen at work and i would love to add this to my backlog i don't know that's outside of my area of expertise um but you can ask uh, uh jimmy recorded, next time like he's download on. the audio yeah. yeah yeah send a different super chat next time jimmy's on <laughs> give us more money and he will give you an answer i i honestly have no idea i think i remember him saying something about it um at some point but i don't know and it's not my channel i just work here uh, but thank you so much for asking, and thank you so much for the monies. Um, probably, I'm going to leave you with probably. Uh, 999 from Megan Marie. Thank you all for taking my call, Forrest and Gordon. I was nervous, to, uh, but it was fun to talk to you both. Have a great Thanksgiving. Can't wait to listen to it again tomorrow at work. Thank you so much for calling in, and thank you so much for the monies. That's very, very kind of you. So sweet. Thanks, Megan. Uh, 499 from Skeptic Dank. Reject crab and praise monkey. Yeah, a lot of people love this meme about like how evolution tends towards crabs with everything. No, it tends towards crabs specifically with marine arthropods. And there are even some arthropods. instances where it has gone away from that body plan. It's not just every damn thing becomes a crab. Can I bring up one thing that I talk about recently, like regularly though? Yeah, So for sure. Are, you know, people are now familiar with carcinization and that example makes sense for people who've seen like Hank Green videos. Um, the yeah, fungi yeah. world, has its own version of that. So it's not carcinization, but it is the fact that almost every mushroom form has evolved into a truffle form. So as a mushroom, your goal is to spread spores. So you spread yeah. spores usually by dropping them from the gills. But 
what happens if it's a dry area, you have lots of fluctuation in temperature, humidity, et cetera, your mushroom dries out, doesn't get to spread its gills. So over time, those mushrooms start to evolve to have more and more closed gills to protect themselves from changes in moisture and humidity. And at some point, and you see these, there's things called pouch fungi or sacotioid, and they're sort of a hybrid between having open gills and sort of being closed. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff that have literally just moved to living completely and fully underground as a truffle. Not all of them are edible, but almost every major category of mushroom has a like intermediate sacotioid version as well as a full on like hypogeus gastroid, but that means like underground internal spore version of a mushroom. So just like carcinization, it's a lifestyle thing that's selecting across many different genetic lineages for one convergent evolutionary form, which again, you could talk about in your homological breakdown of evolution. <laughs> right. That's pretty fucking sick, dude. I didn't know that. That's great. Uh, <laughs> the $10 are a good from- example of convergent evolution in, in fungi. That's that's so cool. Uh, I'm absolutely going to bring that up later, and I'm not going to explain it half as well. Uh, Ten dollars <laughs> from Whiskey Spirit Guy. What happens if I offer a Subway sandwich to Roland and make my wish for a Subway sandwich? Uh, you know what? I always say that if you put the sandwich in the closet and he doesn't take it, that means he extra loves you, and that you you just get the sandwich back. And maybe that's what it is. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Roland's a good guy. Or you know? could it He's be infinite dude. Subway sandwiches? That's what I want to know. They, they, maybe you found an infinite food hack. Um, Nineteen ninety nine, exactly. Nineteen ninety nine from Strobes. Another great show, guys. Forrest, you might have already answered this, but how did your thesis defense go? No doubt it was great, but we we're all rooting for you. Thank you so much. It really means a lot. I know uh, uh, Jimmy told a lot of people about what was going on, but yeah, I, I, I was actually successful. Um, and I'm finishing up the final edits right now, so we can publish that through ProQuest, and I can finish this thing, because I've already started a second Masters, um, which may or may not yeah, turn into a PhD. Really, We're seeing what happens. Mean, dude. I mean, I did a PhD, but that was took me so goddamn long. You're doing a second Masters? It, I might the change brain. it to a PhD later, or I might do one on top of it, because if I do the Masters and the PhD at the same thing, then I'd only lose six credit hours, and it's like, whatever, you know? But it's, it's in biomed, which I love. Um, you want to see some shit? One of the, I can show this on this channel, one of the um, extra credit things was to show the difference between male and female perineum. So here I've got some taints Ooh. drawn up here on my oh, whiteboard wow. in my office. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> And that counted for grad school credit, y'all. And, uh, yeah, but, um, you know, I used to draw that kind of stuff when I was drinking, but it, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And never miss an opportunity. Accurate. I mean, I, I love doing stuff like that while drinking, but usually it was just my friends and they'd tell me I was gross. Here, you got to do this for school? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the thesis event went great. We're going to publish it and then we're going to chop it up into other pieces and use the model and the thesis itself as several more pieces. So check me out on Google Scholar, y'all, and you'll see more than just my presentations pretty soon. Because right now, if you look me up on Google Scholar, you'll just see abstracts that I you know, have given at, at, at conferences. But uh, it'll actually be some proper papers coming up in there. It'd be pretty nice. Um, I, I cannot second- wait to call you Dr. Dr. Valkai. It, you know what, dude? It feels so right. Someday. I just don't know if I have the time in my life nice. to do a dissertation right now. I don't know. Uh, but maybe someday. Maybe someday. Uh, Whiskey Spirit Guide also sent $10 to say R versus K. Nice. Um, personally, I prefer pirates over diamonds, but you guys can explain evolution more if you want or don't. I'm not your mom. <laughs> um, yeah, we did talk mom. about it. So R, R selection versus K selection very briefly is, is about that, that reproductive strategy that Gordon was talking about. So you can remember R selection stands for rate of reproduction. It doesn't actually, but just it's a it, mnemonic device. Um, R selected species are like insects, amphibians, um, uh, that, that have a bazillion ba- rodents. Yeah, they have a bazillion babies. A lot of them die. A lot of them dehydrate. Mushrooms are R selected for sure. Um, a lot of them get eaten by predators, but because they have so goddamn many, it's very likely that a handful of them will survive, and then those ones will have so goddamn many more. K selection, K, you can think of it as carrying capacity spelled wrong. Um, K selected species have slower reproduction rates, but they invest more energy into that reproduction of, of that or into that one offspring. So humans, elephants, great example, long gestation period, a um, lot of in- maternal and paternal investment, a lot of, I should say, parental investment, and depending on how it's separated per culture or per species. Um, 
And then that one will have another one or another two or whatever like that. So low fecundity rate, but high investment and high, high energetic uh, uh, investment in that species. So those are the difference between R and K selection. Um, it is a relative term in, as well. You should remember that. Yeah, that's, that's it's, it's relative that every every category of animal and fungi yeah. and plant and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Did I miss anything important there? Or like, do you think I should add? No, I, I think that's a great explanation. I mean, again, there's microcosms as we slide between like bacteria and archaea and eukarya and plants and animals and fungi and all that kind of thing. But like, yes, yeah, you were correct. <laughs> Th those things. I, I, just make I, sure I didn't I'm even know what R versus K was evolution was. I know the strategies. I didn't know they had names though. So like, I learned something. <laughs> uh, $20 from uh, Xavier Dillon. Thanks for the call. Sorry to perplex you, Forrest. I'm just a weird guy, lol. Keep up the great work. Like I said, the call, man. Mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate the time of you talking to us. Please call back again sometime. Yeah, we got, we got Xavier and Megan coming back to talk to us and thank us. So I, I appreciate them for being here. That's incredible. Super you know, sweet. Spurred a lot of interesting uh, conversation. For definitely, yeah, definitely. Uh, $10 from BTF Wayne. Uh, ever notice how religions will murder each other over God claims, but the moment an atheist walks into the room, they will group up and accept anything as evidence of those God claims? Yeah, yeah. It's hard to be in it's the club. It's because atheists you know? are aliens. Aliens. Canadian aliens. Atheists come from Canada and we're aliens. <laughs> That's what it is. I hate to tell you, I'm, kind of like, I'm a pseudo Canadian. I'm a I am. <laughs> Canadian. I yes. know. How are you pseudo Canadian? What does that even mean? Both my I'm I was born and raised in Boston, but both my parents are Canadian, eh? So I have if I get excited, oh. my oots and boots come out. And I've gone to Canada oh, a lot okay. in my life. And I'd, I'd rather also, in an international travel kind of thing, identify as a Canadian rather than an American because that's a useful, you know, masking, code shift, code, uh, whatever, switching kind of thing. I'm Canadian is like saying, you just, I won't shoot. You know what I mean? It's, it's kind of that, well, you know. Mostly I say sorry all the time unnecessarily. And that's my most Canadian trait. I'm not actually sorry. I'm just Canadian sorry. Yeah. <laughs> It's the apologetics of Canada mixed with the hospitality of the American South just makes the best possible person. And you'd think there would be that, but actually what you find in the middle is like fucking Boston and shit. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's where I'm from. So uh, there's, uh, I'm also, a Bus I'm a pseudo Canadian cause I'm also a Bostonian. So I'm kind did of I would say I did. Do you follow, um, uh, I think it's Ricky Rick PhD. It's, it, is it on, on TikTok? Um, I forgot his last I'm name, sure him. but he's, yeah, he's this guy named Ricky and he's a, a PhD um, in, I think he's studying, he's doing cancer research right now. I forgot what his actual doctorate is in, um, but he's like this surfer bro that went and got a PhD just cause, and um, now nice. he lives in Philadelphia and Dope. he said the most Philadelphia thing I've ever fucking heard once. And it was, he was talking about like, he was walking home to, to from work and he got hit by a car just he was in the crosswalk and this car just hit him and he said i rolled up on the hood and i punched the car pretty good and i left a pretty good dent in it so i think we're about even and i just walked on home and I'm like that's that is so like northeast america that is the that is what Bam. that is you know <laughs> just oh fuck you you hit me with a car i dent your car yeah. fuck you and i go yeah. home it's fine fuck you <laughs> fuck you yeah. yeah i'm walking here but like yeah. everywhere else in Canada, in the South, it would we'd, we'd, be a whole different situation. I'm going to sue but, you. I'm calling the cops. No, just fuck you, yeah, buddy. Yeah, yeah, fuck it. Yeah. Five dollars from Paramount uh, Paramount X. Um, I would say that washing your chicken was the old practice that has a, a, its usefulness back when it first made the uh, first was made, but lost its practicality recently. I'm having a hard time reading today. Yeah, um, there's actually been. Uh, I think there's been some some announcement from like the CTC and from shit like all you're doing at this point when you wash your chicken is splashing some salmonella around. There's really no reason to do it anymore because it's already sanitized and put in the thing. I still do it because I think that fermentation going on in that package is gross and I'm going to rinse a little bit of it off, but I do it gently, you know? Can I, yeah, I, one, one thing. A, a, that's it's not a terrible idea because it's all about bio load, right? So if you're washing off some of the salmonella, it might be on the surface. Not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. um, salmonella yeah. traditionally has always been a very small part of the chicken microbiome. And it's only because we feed them so many antibiotics that it's become a major player. 
And essentially the yeah. American food industry decided that like we could not control the outbreak. So now we just tell people to cook chicken to an unreasonable temperature. But that's not the case in many other countries where they don't necessarily raise chickens the way we do in factory farms or feed them as such a huge cocktail of antibiotics. So the chicken microbiome is different and salmonella is not an issue. And you can actually eat raw chicken and consume like raw, like undercooked chicken products in other countries and not get sick. So huh. that's that was wild. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, food, food, food also, safety. So there's a, uh, a great like food spoilage movie that came out recently. I think it's food problem or something. It's spoilage, whatever. It's good. Watch it. I'll tell you all right about on. food. I also food. just want to, I want to reiterate the word bio load. That's a great word. Everybody should use the word bio load more often. Uh, it looks like we had one come up, but it changed. I think that's because it was accidentally the one that just popped in. So we'll go over this one next. Four ninety nine from George Luther. Could you speak on horizontal gene transfer and the evolutionary history of psilocybin? Also, reishi, lion's mane, et cetera, uh, and the medicine versus pseudoscience. Um, I can knock out horizontal gene transfer. Everything else is 100% on you. Okay. Good. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Horizontal gene, gene transfer is uh, sharing of genes across uh, 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 individuals in bacteria. Um, and so uh, you have, I think other microorganisms do it too, but I know for sure bacteria do. And so what you have is instead of having sex, you just literally take a plasmid, which Gordon talked about earlier, it's just a little tiny piece of bacterial DNA and transfer it from one to the other. Um, and that's really useful in terms of like, because th bacteria do have a thing called conjugation, which is basically bacterial sex. You actually make a little tube yeah, that connects two bacteria together. It's literally together. called a sex pili. They're like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Transfer. And they can yeah. send, they can send genes that way. Horizontal gene transfer doesn't work exactly that way. They can almost just like fucking slurp up different genes. And what's really cool um, is that uh, you can have a virulent pathogenic bacteria something that's actually harmful and kill it completely put heat to it and, and kill them all off and then take non-virulent harmless bacteria and put them in there the harmless bacteria through horizontal gene transfer can literally just slurp up the dna of the dead harmful bacteria and become harmful bacteria themselves it's really fucking cool um, there's it's, other it's ways that to trading, do that trading card thing, right? They're like, Ooh, that looks like a good card. I might put that in yeah. my deck and see how it works. <laughs> oh shit. Now I can infect humans. Hell yeah. One time in an undergraduate, uh, uh, cell bio lab, I made antibiotic resistant bacteria this way. I put them in a thermocycler over and over. So it would just break open their cell walls a little bit, pumped in a plasmid for, for antibiotic resistance and then cooled them and, and put them in just to, to let them grow in an agar plate for a while. And they were able to grow on an agar plate that was smeared with antibiotics. And I had to kill them with a lot of fire. Um, and so, yeah, it's just a thing you can have. So horizontal gene transfer is just, as far as I remember, it's just the term for non, uh, uh, hereditary it's non gene hierarchical hair yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah it's just it's horizontal rather than vertical right. yeah and it, so I hope that helps and, and then everything else is on you wait so horizontal gene transfer is the thing that fungi do a lot they're able to like uptake naked dna from their environment and similar to bacteria like hey i'm gonna try out this piece of dna and see what it does and over a long mm. period of time we talked about evolution if that is advantageous for it to hang on to it it might incorporate that into its genome and make it a permanent part of its genome and that's right. been sort of the guess with psilocybin uh, because production of psilocybin is seen across multiple different genres. So there's psilocybe, which is the main one we think of like magic mushrooms, but like Gymnopolis, Penelius, Pluteus, there's a bunch of different, like most of them are all saprotrophic. So there may have been like one, you know, universal common ancestor at some point, And some of these things radiated, radiated out and just lost the ability then to make oh. Um, you, keep, Simon, you keep going. I'll be, I'll be right back. I'm just going to step away for a second, but oh, I'll, okay. I'll, I'm listening. Yeah, shoot. Yep. <laughs> so the um, the purpose of psilocybin is still unknown, and we don't fully understand it. So it's present across multiple different genera, uh, but for the most part, it's concentrated. The ability, biosynthetic capacity to make psilocybin is is concentrated in the genus Psilocybe. There's a very closely related genetically look genus that also looks very similar called Deconia. And none of those are active in that they do not contain psilocybin. Um, so it's still an outstanding question. It's like, well, why does Gymnopolis and Penelius and some of these other genera have the capacity to make psilocybin? We don't know. Um, it's fairly clear that psilocybin serves as a uh, antioxidant. And that's what the blue staining reaction is, is it's acting as an antioxidant. Uh, 
it's not clear if it has served any evolutionary purpose for the mushroom because there's a lot of mushrooms that evolve like bitter compounds. So if an animal takes a bite of that compound, it gets a big hit of bitter and it's like, ew, no, that's toxic. I don't want to eat that. And that might help that mushroom survive, you know, predatory animals that would eat it before it has a chance to spread its spores. There's plenty of other mushrooms that are like, man, I'm delicious or interesting looking, or I smell like shit. So come eat me. It's an invitation for animals to come eat it. So there's different strategies there. But the presence of psilocybin doesn't necessarily make sense as a deterrent for animals because A, it takes like 20, 30, 40 minutes to kick in. So it's not an immediate effect. And, uh, you know, the only thing people can really theorize is that maybe like producing psilocybin is a thing to be like, well, animals seem to like this. So maybe they'll spread me around. And that certainly happened with yeast. Yeast make a mind altering chemical called ethanol that we have made yeast one of the most widespread fungi in the entire world because humans like getting drunk, right? Um, I don't know if necessarily mushrooms are that intelligent and that's why they're making psilocybin. Um, the idea is, Forrest and I talked about this years ago, is actually one of the reasons I contacted him because I want to have a discussion about the Stone Ape theorem, which says that yeah. uh, it, it was postulated by, I believe, Dennis McKenna and has been supported by Paul Stamets and a few other kind of psychedelia related educators. Um, and it's a great idea because it makes a ton of sense if you're on drugs. As soon as you're not on drugs, you should think a little bit more critically about the history of evolution and recognize that, again, similar to the conversations we have about ghosts and aliens and other things, there's absolutely no evidence or proof for the fact that psilocybin had any effect on human evolution. We have a long history of looking at genes like the FOX2P gene family and other things that are involved in the language formation in human society and how that tracks through all of those different like hominid lineages that, that Forrest was talking about. So I think yeah. psilocybin is super interesting. Um, we don't really know what it does. Uh, one last story about it is there's this uh, fungus called Massospora and it infects cicadas and there's a certain species of Massospora, not all Massospora species, but there's one that infects cicadas and it pumps psilocybin into their brains and causes this them to, um, well, for, first of all, the fungus infects them and rots off their butt. So the entire back half of their body turns into a big mass of spores. The mycelium grows through the insect to the point that there's not much insect left, it's mostly mycelium. It pumps psilocybin into the, what's left of the brain of the insect and then causes it to dance around like a crazy transsexual zombie and attract mates to come mate with it and then cover, get covered in those spores. Um, so that's a way that a fungus is using psilocybin to do mind altering mind control uh, in this. It's not a cordyceps, but it's a similar kind of concept. And basically, it's a fungal STD. Um, it, very, very, very shortly with regards to all the medicinal mushrooms, um, there's a lot of pseud pseudoscience and bullshit out there. But I will say that mushroom polysaccharides are have immunomodulatory functions in the human body, and they can, in theory, help uh, prime and activate our immune system and that's very helpful for helping resist colds and, and as well as an adjuvant for cancer treatments fucking wild <laughs> bro <laughs> love all that shit so fucking crazy fucking dancing around like tim curry like that was, i was like what you said like the sweet transvestite from transylvania thing like, oh, it's crazy massaspora is is wild and it affects both periodic and uh those like you know annual cicadas and there's ones there's one that makes cathinone which is sort of a methamphetamine and there's one that does psilocybin there's a, a huge diversity of life there it's incredible it's so cool fucking nutty you um we got uh 4.99 uh from i'm gonna say it wrong uh, Maining, 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 Link, Maining, Link, 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 Link. Uh, this guy here says, "Here's money for Jimmy having to promote the super chats via Discord." Um, how about those orcas chasing chips and playing metal music? Lol, love them. Uh, from S W M O from the swamp, Southwest of Missouri. No, oh. no. No, it's the swamp of uh, uh, women making Oreos. What? Okay. Fucking interesting. Get, get out of there. Get out of there. Dude, I was, I was rooting for the orcas. I was rooting for the orcas. Yeah. 
<laughs> so cool. Um, Five dollars from Laughlin Gordon. Could you speak about the usefulness of INAT and community science? Uh, also, thoughts on the taxonomic mess that some genuses are. Uh, these, and these are a couple of genera, genera that I haven't heard of. Rusula and whatnot. Uh, Rusula and Anosby. Yeah, so uh, very quickly, iNaturalist is an amazing community science platform. Um, it's supposed to a website, so iNaturalist.org, and it's an app that you can have on your phone. Uh, it is mm -hmm. publicly funded by the California Academy of Sciences, so it will never try to charge you a subscription fee. It is, they will occasionally ask for like a donation, but it's free and it's not going to charge you money, whereas all other ID apps are going to scam you and try to get you to pay money at some point. And even if it's Google, you're paying because Google is taking all of your personal information and your metadata and all that bullshit. Um, iNaturalist has an amazing algorithm where you can take a picture of literally any living thing from a mushroom to a bird, to a seaweed, to an insect, to whatever you hell you, you don't even have to know if it's alive. You can take a picture of insulation foam. If you think it's alive, it might get confused because insulation foam is not alive. But for the most part, iNat is really good at telling you what's in front of you. And it gives you this amazing capacity because so many people ask me all the time, like, oh, I want to start mushroom foraging, but I'm so scared. And you're like, what are you scared of? And they're like, well, I'm going to eat something poisonous. And be like, would you go out in the forest and eat a random mushroom? And they're like, no. Then, then I'm like, well, then why are you so afraid? I'm like, well, I don't know where to start. I'm like, iNaturalist is where you start. Take your phone, take a photo, and upload it to this amazing app that then gives you, at least points you in the direction. It's not always correct. There's certain types of mushrooms and other organisms it struggles with, but it's usually really, really good with birds. It's really good with insects. It's really good with plants. It does okay with fungi, and it does a lot better than having no answer at all. It also does a much better job than any of the other bullshit apps out there that are trying to constantly scam you and get you to pay money. The other thing I absolutely love about uh, iNaturalist with regards to community science is that it's most of the contributions are from community members naturalists and people who are just you know out walking their dog it's phenology the idea of observing what's around you at different points in time you upload that photos and then science are able to look at the metadata and look at the distribution of species as a function of like year and timing and look at how maybe the distribution or the timing of species is changing as a function of stuff like climate change so by using this app to teach yourself you're also helping to advance science all for free and there might even be a point where like maybe you take a picture of something randomly while you're out walking your dog and a scientist like emails you and is like, hey, can you grab that specimen and send it to us? Because holy shit, we've never seen that, you know, that species here before. And we want to see if it's this or that. Um, in terms of taxonomy, uh, it's a freaking mess. Um, there's a lot of push and pull right now because of DNA sequencing. And there's basically two main approaches. There's lumping and splitting. So last year, a paper came out that said that all porcini, all boletus edulis, king boletes, of which there are like many different species, Rex veris, rubriceps, uh, all these different things are actually all the same species and should just be considered part of one giant species group or complex. We we're talking about earlier about the species concept. There's many things that are sort of like, they're all sort of mostly the same, so we're going to call them one thing. And then there's other people who would alternatively make the argument that they should all be a different thing. So last year, another paper came out that took Cortinarius, which is this incredibly complex genus and had over like 3,000 species in it, and said, well, we're going to turn Cortinarius into 10 different species. And the scientific community said, well, we'll accept about seven of those, but fuck your 10. So out of 10 things that were proposed, about seven of them have been accepted. So it's still a mess, is I guess what I'm trying to say. Because some people are trying to lump shit, some people are trying to split shit, and those people are fighting. And there's a lot of ego Jesus. and old white guys involved in this. This whole time, I've been trying to manage. I I, I downloaded iNaturalist while you're talking, uh, because Ooh. I had I have the picture of this app, which it is a subscription oh, yeah. based. It's, it's like trash. awesome. Yeah, no, and I use that it's, for, it's, for yeah. well, I use it for plants, AI and I have the other one that was for insects as well. And like, at, I I'm paying a subscription for of these things, and it's free. Yeah, I just, and you're helping dude, scientists. My phone already is, looks like a Pokedex, and now I'm making it more of a Pokedex. You know what I mean? I'm going to go and snap yeah. pictures of everything. Literally anything. You're like, what is this? Boom, iNat, and you have a freaking answer. You look like a genius. It's amazing. I love it. That's what I love the the freaking the picture of this app. But if it costs money and it's not supposed to, fuck that, dude. Uh, yeah, dude. Use I'll iNet. I'll figure out. I'm trying to figure out how to manage my subscriptions on Google Play now because it won't tell, help me. But I'll tell I'll get there. Google to use iNet. 
INAT is an amazing resource. I'm featuring it prominently in my book. Nice. I will absolutely check it out. Uh, $10 from Larry Fishman. The only thing we need to know for uh, for sure are needed for sapient technology, technological species to evolve is an occasionally apocalyptic environment and time. The mediocrity principle says aliens, aliens are everywhere. I can vibe with that. But, yeah, I mean, I, I dig it. It's a whole lot of nothing, but I, I dig it. <laughs> <laughs> it's It's... it's one of those things with that, I don't know how we would have a conversation about it, but it's cool. Uh, the reason I mean, we, we haven't found it. We, we are aliens. Bro. Right. The reason we haven't found yeah. anyone uh, else yet is that we live in the galactic equivalent of rural Nebraska. Right, Nebraska doesn't exist. Too far from doesn't anywhere exist. or anyone uh, to hear the radio signals. Inverse square law to be busy. Yeah, I and mean, that's one thing that I talk about a lot whenever people talk about like how we, you know, well, we've been looking for aliens. We haven't found anything. I don't believe that they're here, but as far as aliens existing at all, I think it's crazy to suggest that we're the only place in the entire fucking world that has life. You know, or the entire universe that has life. Um, and that's one thing I, mean, I try to talk about a lot. I, I think yeah. The Milky Way is really pretty, but it's clearly podunk as fuck because we're the only species that's here. Exactly. That we know about. Exactly. It's just... You know, the, the amount of time that it would take to send the message, to receive the message, they have to be technologically advanced enough to get the message, to to write back, to if they want to write back, and then, then we have to wait for the message to get back to us. It's like, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, I think, summed up really well. He said, you know, it's like walking to the edge of the ocean, scooping up a, a cup of water and saying, there's no whales in the ocean because you didnn't find any yet in this sample that you've taken. Like, doesn't make any sense. Another $5 in Larry Fishman. There's 25 so far. Question for not Erica. Could slime molds be taught uh, to use tools? Oh, I have some shit to say about that, but I'm sure you have more shit to say about that. So slime molds and mycelium both display what's called network intelligence. And that's the idea that there's like a lot of little growing tips and each little tip is equivalent to like a brain in that it's the decision-making center. It can go left, it can go right, it can go up, it can go down. It's sensing light, it's sensing temperature, humidity, uh, nutrients, competition, all these kinds of things. And yet, across every single one of those little growing tips, they're all able to coordinate. So how the fuck does that happen? Because they don't have a central brain. So they display this ability of called network intelligence because there's molecules and signaling and all sorts of chemical reactions and things happening within the organism. So it's coordinating its behavior and moving, making decisions to what's called tax, i.e. move towards or away from certain stimuli because it's going to want to move towards food. It's going to move away from like too much heat and light. Um, so they are intelligent in that sense, and you can get them to form, like, solve mazes and do simple, like, problem-solving things that are based on, like, temporal and spatial things. Um, but I think to ask them to use a tool, like, like we can train crows. Corvids are really good at figuring out how to use tools. You can even mm -hmm. sort of get some other animals. I mean, I know pigs can do it. Um, I don't know. And, like, clearly monkeys use tools. Again, I don't know why human, I think humans are so special because we use tools because freaking monkeys use shit all the time. Um, you know, even ant eaters evolve, evolve their own tool. Like, <laughs> lots of animals use tools. Um, but as far as I've seen, no, I don't, I don't think it would be possible to get a slime mold to use a tool because there's not really a, like, a mechanism for them to use it. Well, I think it's interesting is the, the example that I usually give is um, I just double checked to make sure I got this right. It was back in 2010 um, was the uh, some researchers in Japan took uh, uh, an agar plate, a growing plate, and they put bits of uh, uh, food on like if they were to have the, a map of Tokyo and they made a map of Tokyo. Map. Yeah, yeah, with bits of food being the nodes of the uh, the train sta uh, train uh, path, of the, what do you call it? the subway, I guess. Um, yeah, and they put stations. a slime mold in there. Yeah, yeah, and the slime mold connected all of the stations and then died off in all the places where it was the least efficient. And what it ended up making was a map that was almost identical to the map that like the best engineers in Japan figured out as the most efficient routes. Um, and so this, you know, just by nature of nature, this organism was able to figure out this super complex, efficient pathway that it took brilliant engineers years to develop in a matter of, you know, a few, however many hours it takes for slime molds to do their thing. So just super freaking cool. And as, in terms of tools, I don't know about picking up and using something with your thumbs that the slime molds have, but in terms of like maybe connecting a thing, hitting a switch to, 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 but through electrical impulse, through squish, 
squish power, whatever squishing powers that slime molds have. I don't know, man. I'm open to new ideas. I'm I'm, I'm a pretty 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 open minded guy. Uh, how did zombie fungi evolve? Talk about cordyceps and all the rest of them. Slackback. Uh, do you have an evolutionary history of phylogeny of of zombie fungi off the top of your head? Not off the top of my head, but they're they're part of a like I mentioned massaspora as another mm -hmm. thing that kind of zombifies the insects and is making them do weird out of pocket stuff. So that's part of a, a larger group of uh, fungi that infect insects called entomopathogens. So there's multiple different uh, lineages of entomopathogenic fungi. So it's something that again has evolved multiple times across many different lineages because it's a lifestyle thing. So fungi uh, started out originally in water as kind of little swimmy things that didn't look that much different from like an amoeba. And those are still around. We still have chytrids. In fact, chytrids have caused a massive worldwide epidemic for all uh, amphibians and newts and salamanders and frogs. And a part of the reason that those populations have like died off so much because there's a uh, disease, chytrid disease, fungal disease that has been spread around by humans uh, that has killed something like half of the world's amphibians, just like in the last like, 20, 30 years. Um, so wow. that's the thing. But entomopathogenic fungi, fungi are like, hey, look at this thing. It doesn't have a parasite yet. Cool. I'm going to like do some horizontal gene transfer and like play around my, my playing cards until I figure out how to infect this thing and cause the disease. Because look, it doesn't, there's nothing eating it yet. And that's what right. fungi really did good at doing is just figuring out like, hey, can I eat this? Well, not yet, but let me like fuck around until I figure out how to eat this thing. Um, and so that is it. part of why there's so many different lineages of endopathogenic fungi. And so there's, and the other idea is that there's a lot of things that are kind of generalist. So there's certain ones that are just like, oh, infect any insect, cause a little bit of a mold, make a spore, reproduce. And there's some other ones that are like very hyper specific to a certain species and make them do very certain behaviors. And that's what we see as like the cordyceps and some of the zombie fungi as these like very highly evolved uh, interactions that are usually very specific to one insect species and one fungi species together, but there's also fungi that can have two different forms. So sometimes, it'll, like in its sexual form, it'll be this like cordyceps, and in its asexual form, it'll be like a generalist that can affect almost any insect. And it's just whether it wants to do asexual reproduction, which is good for like the here and now, or sexual reproduction, which is good for the future. Makes sense. I love it. Super cool. Uh, did we skip one accidentally, one of the super chats? I think we had one pop up and then it went away and I didn't read it and I don't know if it was a repeat or one that we accidentally skipped. I don't know. Uh, looks like it's not coming back, so I'm just going to start reading this one. $10 from Empress okay. Lizard. Uh, what are your top three fungi and why? Uh, Portobello, Shiitake, and King Oyster because they're fucking delicious. Oh, and Enoki. I guess Enoki. Enoki can go in there too. In my top three, there's four. And okay. what are your uh, I make a dual mushroom are, soup those, are, those, those are all mushrooms, so I'm going to stay away from mushrooms and stick with just fungi. Uh, I'm going to say uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which does fermentation mm -hmm. of beer, wine, bread. Uh, Aspergillus oryzae, which is what we use to make miso and um, soy sauce. And then maybe penicillium, which is the mold that we use for blue cheese and salami and to make the antibiotic penicillin i did not know that those were the same thing that's so cool that's wild for real though next time if, if you and i ever meet in person i make an amazing mushroom tom yum soup it's so fucking Ooh. good dude yeah i love that uh five dollars a monkey at typewriter sometimes i just stop and think to myself all that separates us from the noble platypus is a taint and a poison back and a poison back kick go fuck yourself jimmy yeah dude um that's Honestly, I, I love whenever people talk about like macroevolution and they're like, you can't change between kinds. There's no elephant that creates a squid or whatever. And it's like, what's the difference between any two organisms ever? It's DNA. That's the only difference between any two organisms ever is the DNA. Like, what do you think? Well, it was the epigenome is still technically DNA compaction, but so yes, yeah, yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying, like you know, the 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 only actual for real difference between me and a deer and a squid and a bacteria is that genome. And so, like, it, if you just change the instructions, you get a different thing. That's not hard to think about. <laughs> so yeah, the yes. difference between us and a platypus, it's the DNA that makes our taints differently. It's very, it's, it's it. Um, five do, more do, dollars. Do, 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 platypi, do platypi have 
taints? Is that? I mean, that's a that's a zoology question that I'm not prepared to answer. I believe they have cloacas, they, so I guess they wouldn't. This is okay. Okay, I was going to say this is perennial. why I have weird Google searches because I'm going to type in do plant have taints? <laughs> I'm looking out. Do they have a do they have a cloaca? Does platypus have cloaca? Yeah, Let me just double cloaca. check. They wow. do have a cloaca, so oh, I guess so they couldn't. No taint. There couldn't. I mean, be a taint. is the air, is the is the general area around a cloaca still a taint, or is that only a perineum between asshole and genital? So what, in, in what anatomy, <laughs> yeah, yeah, in, in anatomy, like that whole thing would be described as like a perennial area, uh, but like I think the taint specifically must be the fleshy fun bridge. I don't think that it can. I, if you don't have that, what's what are you going to do with that? You know what I mean? Maybe is it is it that there's no taint, or is it the entire animal is the taint? Is the question? Is it? You know what I mean? I mean it's like does, feeling like a giant taint. I mean, I get it. You know, does a does a straw have one hole or two? Is the same? You know what I mean? Like if we're going to say that there isn't a taint because there's only the one hole, then all of it's the taint. Platypuses are taints. You heard it here first, folks. Welcome to science class. <laughs> um, we got five more dollars from Monkey and Typewriter. God damn. We paid a lot of money for school, and this is what we're doing. Uh, also, Forrest, maybe don't brag about breeding super bacteria in the aftermath of a global pandemic. Don't want the CDC fuzz busting your door down. They can't stop me. <laughs> also, that uh, was a virus. $5. No, not a bacteria. Yeah, it's exactly. It's totally different. It's totally different. Bacteria have never caused anybody any problems. Don't look up the plague. Yeah, black, um, black plague, yeah, not a thing. <laughs> your Yersinia pestis. Your Yersinia pestis. Your Yersinia pestis nuts. I don't know. Uh, $5 from Chris Carrillo. Uh, could some of the biblical authors have eaten some psilocybin mushrooms? They smell terrible but have an amazing effect, so I've heard. They, I don't even know if they have a smell. They have a bad taste, but like it is what it is. Not I mean, that I would. I mean, if, if you don't, so the, the smell of mushrooms is often uh, dependent on eight carbon alcohols, like octanol mm. and different isomers of that. Um, so if you are sensitive to octanol, maybe you just don't like the smell of mold, that kind of thing. It's a common fungal metabolite. Um, it's entirely mm. possible there are psilocybin species in the Middle East where those authors may have been, and it certainly would explain some of the imaginative stories that are told in that piece of fiction known as the Bible. I, I feel like it's also important to point out that like the Bible isn't the only, you know, uh, uh, literary fiction that, that is defined the culture from time to, you know, like there's, there's a lot of shit that can come from. And like, you, you know, we talked about the stoned ape theory for a while ago. You, you mentioned like maybe a lot of religious things came from these kinds of things. And, and I mentioned earlier on the show that if you've ever had a religious experience, Go to a rock concert. You'll have another one. When you have people all vibing at the same time with the drum beating and all these things, you're going to have yeah. those kinds of things. Um, and also you see the effects of like uh, uh, when you, I forgot what the fungus is that infects rye. That's the cause of like the Salem witch trials and shit. Yeah. You know, we got clapiceps so that it that's makes, the one. It yeah, makes yeah. an LSD lysergenic acid um, precursor. Yeah, so like you have all sorts of things in history that are confirmed the result of, of right. you know, some crazy psychedelic mushroom. Uh, I don't see any reason to say that having a group of people have that same kind of effect and then to creating a whole ass religion out of it. What would have happened if Salem hadn't stopped and then those people wrote down what happened and then long after that infection was gone? And long at, they still kept to the code that was written by the people who burned those witches. You know what I mean? Like, or right. actually, hang. Also, very telling. Very tellingly, there was no men tried. Right? No, of course not. It was only women. Of course not. Yeah. No, it's it's it, the, the, the 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 they were tripping balls that didn't make them not sexist anymore. <laughs> like it's it's the same. And that was one thing. There was a really interesting conversation about, and this is kind of on topic, a little bit, but like. There was a really interesting conversation about why uh, films like The Exorcist are so scary. Um, and it was that The Exorcist is scarier for men than it is for women because, like, one of the, the scariest things was that the girl was acting out sexually. She was being perverse. And the idea mm. of 
this not pure chaste virgin child. Oh, the, 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 it was the un, uh, uh, the, the kind of the patriarchal fear of yes. like, oh, the yeah, sexual yeah. liberation that's happening. Um, and you see that a lot with a lot of uh, uh, iconography that we have with witches today. The reason why mm -hmm. witches mm -hmm. ride broomsticks is because they would make right. things called flying mm -hmm. ointments. They would make a bunch of uh, toxic uh, 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 plants and whatnot into a gel that had to be absorbed through mucous membranes to cause hallucinations, and they didn't want to put it in their mouths, so they'd smear it on a broomstick and shove that broomstick up themselves. And so riding a broomstick became riding a broomstick to fly, you know what I mean? And this kind of iconography of that is the fear of sexual liberation and sexual promiscuity being the, the fear of women being magical, evil, demonic beings. Right. It's kind of cool or, connections. Or even, even, even the specter of I'm a woman and I don't need men around. Maybe I prefer yes. the company of other women, which, yes. which, whoa, which, yes, exactly. It's it's so crazy, man. It, you see, like in the like in the Crucible and uh, you know, literature like that, how that's the biggest. I danced naked in the forest. What a horrific thing for a young lady to do. You know what I mean? That that sounds naked. awesome. You know what I mean? Please, yeah, exactly. Please. I'm so brave. That. Invitation uh, to that party. <laughs> <laughs> can we? Can I be the guy who sacrifices the goat and then roasts it whole, and then we can have dinner after our like <laughs> naked orgy? I'm that so into it. It's so yeah. into it. Let's fucking go feral. Uh, Five dollars from Catfish. Uh, are the Canadian sorry and the Midwest ope related evolutionarily? Uh, JK loving the show tonight. I imagine they do have I, I similar think, origins. Yeah. I think they're homological. I'm going to keep using that word because it's not a word. Now we're, we're making it's it a thing a now, but we're going to we're going to own it for ourselves. <laughs> homological structures homological traits i looked it up i don't know if i told you this i looked it up on i was searching the literature for the term and all yeah, i could yeah, find yeah, yeah. was like algebra like a math mm. shit and i'm like okay yeah, it's a, of course is a fucking mathematician misusing biological terms just yeah. like evolutionary well, like I said, psychology the only, the, i i googled it and it came right up but i was like i'm pretty sure this instance on google is the only time it's ever been fucking used in any kind of yeah. to refer to this and it's only exactly. on Google because someone wrote about it. So it's possible that that person may have written about it to describe this thing. And then they create, you know, it's like creating your own meeting by just putting it on the mm -hmm. internet. I, I, it, it's like in, uh, there was a, 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 I did a movie review on my channel of this movie called Gramps Goes to College, which was this like 60 something year yeah. old Christian dude. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, so yeah. Bad. And he's gonna, gonna go to college and prove evolution wrong and all this stuff and at one point oh. he he says uh he's bemoaning this atheistic worldview that says that humans are no more important than any other species and i'm like what the fuck is a species yeah. what are you talking and i looked it up it means currency in the in the form of coins who fucking knew, right? I learned a new thing. It, it's not a biological term. You just said something that sounded right, you weirdo. It's, oh, it's so crazy. Uh, I'll go on about that for I, a I minute. I'm going to be so embarrassed if I was in the production or filming or actor in that movie. Like, oh my God, <laughs> you should be ashamed yeah, for dude. life. God. Wow. Five dollars from That's, Daniel like, Bray. Like, I'd, I'd, rather, I'd rather do porn than be in a movie like that. Yeah, it's right? not worth the thirty dollars you're getting for it. You know what I mean? It can't be. <laughs> Five dollars from Daniel Bray. I was telling someone about a a Amanita muscaria. Uh, make sure to lowercase the species name. Uh, yesterday, uh, that reindeer drink the urine of other reindeer and eat them to trip harder. Thank you. Go fuck yourself, Jimmy. Wild. Okay, um, so really quick primer, Amanita muscaria is one of the most classic, you know, toadstool mushrooms. Everyone knows this is the Mario mushroom. Uh, it's toxic, trippy, and edible, depending on how you process it. So it contains a toxin called ibotenic acid, which is a neurotoxin you can poke holes in your brain and put you into a coma if you consume too much of it. However, uh, it's a prodrug for the compound muscimol, which is an entheogenic substance, which is kind of a, it's a GABA agonist and acts very similar to like alcohol in our system. So it's a depressant, deliriant, dissociative kind of drug. It puts you in a kind of like a woozy haze. Some people are exploring it now for help with sleep. It's been used as a painkiller, but for the most part, it just kind of makes you go, Whoa, I'm like, act all weird. Uh, so if you eat this straight up raw, you'll get poison from Aminata muscaria. Uh, the ibotenic acid will make you probably throw up and have diarrhea so it's very unlikely that barbarians or you know vikings ate it before going into a battle that's a fallacy it's just not true um there's a long history of the sami people in like siberia eating muscaria 
Uh, and the idea was that like the shaman would eat it and then get poisoned, but then their pee would contain the muscimol. And so people would sometimes drink the shaman's pee because it had done this chemical conversion of ibotenic acid into muscimol. Um, fortunately, with better living through chemistry, all you got to do is a simple decarboxylation, which means that if you heat this between like 150 and 200 degrees at a, a low pH, like pH 4, uh, you will complete that conversion. So if you want to take amnium muscaria, you can dry it out. You can then make a tea with it and boil it for a little while with some lemon juice, add some honey, not but ginger, and you can drink that and get all the entheogenic effects of muscimol, which is completely and utterly legal. There's nothing illegal about it. You can buy this online. Someone recently sent me some tincture from uh, Amity Muscaria thing that they're selling at Walmart. So if you want to try Amity Muscaria, you can even now get it at Walmart. Um, and then if you double Wild. boil this mushroom, i.e. you just boil it twice, you get rid of all the ibotenic acid and muscimol, and then you can just cook it up and eat it like a normal mushroom. And it's, it's kind of sweet and nutty and delicious. So that's Amity Muscaria. You don't need to drink reindeer Wild. pee. Please don't drink reindeer pee. You do what you like. You live. I mean, you live. <laughs> if, if, if you really want to drink reindeer pee, that's on you, dude. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. We should put a, a, a word of warning on everything in this episode. Don't, don't try any of this, but these yeah, are the yeah, maybe, ways you could. Don't do this. But don't. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, don't go into don't. nature and do mushrooms. You will not have no. a good time. It's a, it's a terrible exactly. time. <laughs> Five dollars from Paramount X. Can you guys geek out on Marvel's Venom suit and fungi? Because science, please. I don't know anything about. I know what it is, but like, I don't. I don't know. I I would say the one thing that I think is important for people to remember is that symbiote just means one thing living with another thing. A lot of people confuse the words parasite, symbiote, and all these other things. Um, symbiote just means living together. Parasites are a type of symbiote. So a lot of people are like, oh, well, if it's a parasite that doesn't hurt you, it's a symbiote. No, they're always a symbiote. If it if if one is hurt and the other is helped, that's a parasite. If both of them are helped, that's a mutualism relationship. If one is helped and the other one doesn't have any effect at all, that's commensalism. And we're there's a lot of argument in science as to whether or not commensalistic or commensal relationships actually exist. Because if you look closely enough at them, they kind of actually look either mutualistic or parasitic. You know what I mean? That that yeast I mentioned that's on our skin um, is yeah. the malazia is considered sort of commensal. But you know, as yeah. you look at more and more, you're like, well, I guess it's here, and because it's here, nothing else is here. So in that same yeah, sense, like, does it really confer a benefit? No, because sometimes it, it's it's a detriment. You know, tinea versicolor, dandruff. These things are not serious, hurting our fitness, but they're not good things. But maybe we have it on our skin because having something else would be worse. And that's kind of as close as you can get to commensal, right? Um, <laughs> in terms of uh, the parasitism, and, and you're right, symbiosis is, 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 you know, all of these different things. And many fungi like switch it. between being potentially mutualistic to being parasitic at different points in their life cycle. That's a pretty mm -hmm. common thing that fungi do, even within us, candida uh, albicans, which causes a yeast infection, is for the most part actually a little bit mutualistic or at least commensal in that it's blocking out other stuff from getting in, but then sometimes it becomes explodes in a yeast infection and, and that's no fun. Um, with regards to venom, uh, it would be hard to say whether it's fungi, bacteria, virus, whatever. But what I can say is about the parasitism that it usually comes in two flavors. You either have a biotroph or a necrotroph. So biotroph is a parasite that lives on a living host whereas a necrotroph ultimately kills its host. So cordyceps are sort of things that generally kill their host, so it's called a necrotroph, whereas, uh, I don't know, there's these things called beetle hangers, which are sort of just another like fungal STD for beetles. And those don't really have an effect on the fitness, but they hang out on kind of the, the outer carapace of a beetle, and then when beetles bang, they get infected. So that's a biotroph. So you have necrotrophs and biotrophs, and, and venom is definitely a biotroph because the host does not die at least in most cases wild wild i love that uh somebody asked in the chat uh does eddie brock digest venom's poop or vice versa who's who's handling the waste who's handling the waste in this relationship you know what i mean i mean they, it's, yeah, it's two little little organisms. Oh, 30 question. seconds per five dollars max <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, we get excited $10 uh, from IsJL. 
Uh, I want to be forest when I grow up. I'm 60 until a few months ago. I thought Indian pipes were mushrooms. So I mentioned I'm 60. Don't stop learning. They're fucking beautiful flowers and they look real fungally. It's super cool. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So, so I would, um, one, one learning point is I would call them ghost pipes because it's a little bit more culturally sensitive to call them ghost pipes. And that's mm -hmm. Monotropa uniflora. And it, it's what's called a microheterotrophic flower. So those are flowers that do not do any photosynthesis. Instead, they're tapped into the mycelium of mushrooms, which are then getting carbon from their host tree. Uh, but they mm -hmm. are drawing, those plants are drawing all of their carbon out of the mycelial network to produce a flower. And that's that beautiful white flower that comes up, um, which supposedly yeah. has some toxic glycosides. It can also have like pain killing effects. Uh, and usually monotropa uniflora is associated with Russula species, which we talked about earlier, or they're brittle gills. I'm always, I'm back and forth on the term Indian because I prefer not to use it because it, it just seems ridiculous. It seems a little bit insensitive for me, but I live in Oklahoma where most natives that I know use the term Indian. Uh, I, I, I'm at, currently at uh, Oklahoma State University doing this this thing in biomed. And uh, my friend is, uh, this guy who runs is, is also my advisor, um, uh, his name is Dr. Kent Smith. Uh, he himself is Native American, and he runs the uh, the Center for American Indians in Science and Medicine, and that's what he calls it. And he he refers oh, yeah. to himself as Indian. He refers to all so it's like yeah. I don't like the word, but I don't chomp at it when it comes up too much. But like it, it, I I'm just saying I appreciate you saying that, and it it, it, yeah, it, yeah. it well, it's, it's interesting. The, the big the big thing for me is just. Uh, it makes more descriptive, right? Go, you think ghosts yeah. think sort of white apparition, like maybe turning right. black and that's ghost pipes are white. So yeah, for me, it's just yeah. a better descriptive name. It makes so sense. Rather than asking sense. people to memorize monotropa uniflora, which isn't that bad of a science name, but you know, yeah. Ghost. Pipe one name I'm very easier. happy about <laughs> is uh, one name change. I'm very happy about is harvest mites, AKA berry bugs. So happy that those are the names now, as opposed to what they were, the, the little red, Insects, the little red oh, arachnids. Yes. Sorry, not insects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Didn't, didn't love the I names hate, of those guys. It, I mean, the really, old there, name. There, yeah. there a, where am I trying to point it? This stupid lobster thing behind me. I'm on the wrong side. There we go. That thing. <laughs> like, really big versions of that thing on land. Yeah. Crawling all over your skin. Oh, I hate them. Ugh. Ugh. Uh, Swamp Woman Making Oreos and four ninety nine. Thanks so much for the new name for us. Hashtag Team Orca. Hell yeah. Go for those. <laughs> uh ten dollars from gay valdez um so basically quiverful christians aren't our selected species since uh, uh some of the offspring may lose their faith not a perfect metaphor but a fun thought great duo bring gordon back soon oh i hate that go jimmy yourself forest what what so we you should just you have the context we have a thing here uh jimmy snow the producer doesn't like it when people compliment him and so he says rather than compliment me just say go fuck yourself so go fuck yourself jimmy or gfy or uh, uh, j f y j g f y j it's there it's this thing and then go jimmy yourself became a thing with a typo that was st and now they got this monstrosity of an epithet at the end of this fucking super chat i mean i'm saying jesus i might Christ. i might pay to watch that i'd send a super chat to see that I don't want to get jimmied. Nobody, nobody <laughs> wants that. Nobody wants that. Five dollars a monkey at typewriter. Show pitch. One night only. Cage match. Valkai. Walker. Gutsit. Gibbon. Uh, R and Raw. Four biologists enter. One leaves. No thesis barred. I think that you are <laughs> underestimating just how squirrely of a man I am. Why were we talking about hitting me? Man. I was putting away groceries. No, oh, no, it was it's one of the super chats ended with "Go Jimmy yourself, Forest." I don't like. I think it. that just means masturbate. I don't like your name being associated with masturbation in that way. Well, then you I need to look up what the word that. "Jimmy" means in a ton of ways. Also, put a "Jimmy" on it means wear a condom. Worse. There we go. I, I'm from New England, so Jimmy's to me just means sprinkles. So if you want to sprinkle your Jimmy's all over the place, go for it. I don't. I don't like that either. I don't want to be <laughs> sprinkling. I don't want to be sprinkling. Can, no. can I put? Can I put some Jimmy's on your frap? Because that's about as New England mm. as I can get right there. You want Jimmy's What's on your a, frap? Is is no frap shake. frappuccino? Okay. D no, no, it's, it's not. A First, shake. fucking. I'm gonna. No. I'm gonna. I'm gonna Jimmy. I'm gonna Jimmy your frap. Don't. 
Don't and then have a tell hoagie. me that. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> no, no part of it's good. Like it's, it, if a frap is anything but a frappuccino, it sounds horrible. I just I don't like any of it. Uh, I don't and like the to, to Jimmy being the used as a. I don't like Jimmy being used as a verb for any reason. Um, with that, uh, we've come to the end of our show. Gordon, thank you so much for spending so many. It's, it's been almost four hours you've been spending with us today. So thank you so much for your time. Wow. Seriously, it's been absolutely fantastic. It's always fun to hang out with you, man. It's it's fun to chat. Most, likewise, likewise. Um, do you have any projects or anything that you want to shout out? We still got you know about a thousand people yeah. watching. You want to tell anybody anything? Yeah, uh, I've got a podcast. If you like hearing me talk about science or the explanations I gave tonight, I give slightly longer, hopefully better thought out versions of some of these things on my podcast. It's called Fascinated by Fungi. It's on all major streaming platforms as well as on YouTube. Uh, I have a YouTube channel. Please go follow that. I also have a TikTok, an Instagram, a Facebook, a uh, Pinterest, uh, every imaginable social network. I'm also on iNaturalist. You can friend me on that. It doesn't work through the app, but you can do it through the website. Uh, I am currently working on a book, and that'll be coming out at the end of 2024. And it's kind of a book of all the things I ever want to know about the fungal kingdom. There's a lot of stories I told tonight that are like coming out of my research for that book. Some of it's question answers, some of it's mushroom ID, some of it's morphology, some of it's non-mushroom fungi, some of it's just kind of cool phenomena and stories and things that they do. Uh, I live in Napa and don't lead a lot of hikes here, even though people constantly want me to. But when I do events, I will put them on my Instagram story and let people know about them. Uh, I have a lot of my recommendations for books on my Amazon storefront. Uh, I have merch on my website. This is actually a design I'm really proud of. Uh, I used to ship out mushroom care packages to chefs and stuff like that. And I do it from office max. And there's an employee there uh, named Jack, who is a trans person. And we got to chatting one day and they showed me some of their art. And I was like, Jack, I freaking love your art. Would you be willing to do a design for me? And it took me like two years to finally convince Jack to do it, but they made me a logo for pride last year. And what we did is fungi tend to have a lot of different um, sexes. They're called mating types or mating type alleles. And so we specifically chose a couple of different fungi that have a lot of different mating types, i.e. non-binary. And, uh, and that's what's on this shirt. So this is the Red Scarlet Elf Cup. Or this is Red Scarlet Elf Cup. This is Wheat Lacoche Corn Smut, uh, Eustalagomatus. And then this is uh, Jelly Fungi and Schizophyllum Commune. Schizophyllum Commune has 23,000 sexes or mating types. And Jelly Fungi is what I tend to jiggle on the internet. Um, and I think it's a great kind of like amorphous uh proxy for genitalia and, and it's a sort of fun silly way to do sex ed and that's that's part of what i'm addressing uh with my platforms so anyhow I love it so much come to my website get some merch there's original things i can't tell if i'm frozen <laughs> oh, there, oh, we there we go okay i was gonna say I just, I was just saying thanks for being here with me, and then I froze, so that's all. <laughs> that's awesome. I just wanted to make sure, I wasn't sure if I was frozen or what was going on, but yeah, uh, that's so good. And I love that, especially with the, it, it, out the end there. I mentioned earlier on about getting a lot of trans folks and whatnot to call in. Um, we have so many people that are struggling with the concepts of, of sex and gender being different things, and neither one of them being a strict binary. And that's, unfortunately, right. as I talk about a lot, it's kind of like with climate change, where like, Sex not being a strict binary isn't even remotely scientifically contentious, but it's politically controversial now. And so you have a lot of scientists jumping on both sides um, and trying to make some what I think are not great arguments about it. So just I love seeing that, dude. I love it very much. It makes me happy. Well, it's always fun to kind of help people know that, that there's there's a lot of lot a lot of changes going on in the community. Fungi um, will defy every convention that humans have. Yeah, and nothing exactly. makes sense when we start looking at it. Exactly. I love that, dude. Uh, with that, that's the end of our show. So uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Please make sure to support us on Patreon. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe become a, a, a member of the channel if you want to do that. That'd be a pretty cool thing to do. Uh, if you want uh, to... Don't don't play me out. I'm promoting the things. I'm doing what you said. Make sure to tune in uh, on uh, other times. We've got uh, uh, Not Takis on Thursday. We've got Matt and Jeff Blackwell on Wednesday. We've got Dave and Matt tomorrow. <laughs> Make sure to tune in for all those shows. I'm Forrest Malkai. Have a great day and never stop learning. Bye. Bye.